Thank you, Catherine. Good evening, everybody, um, commissioners and council member Ku and members of the public. Um, it's really nice to see you all tonight on this absolutely gorgeous day. And um, I'm looking forward to the meeting tonight. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Um, Catherine, would you take roll, please? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Cribbs? Here. Commissioner Greenfield? Here. Commissioner LaMare? Commissioner Moss? Here. Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Rechtal? Here. Council Member Koo? Here. Five present. Thank six you. Present. Excuse me, six. <laughs> Good, six. Thank you very much. Um, are there any agenda changes, requests, or any deletions? Hearing none, um, we can move on to oral communications. Um, Lam, are you going to? Um, yes, I will begin the oral communications. And did you want to go with two minutes or three minutes? I would like to do our usual two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, give me myself and my colleagues a moment here. We'll start the timer um, and then we'll uh, begin with oral communications. Our first speaker will be uh, uh, Mikhail Shalom, to be followed by Cooper Phillips. And then we will uh, get our timer up and begin shortly. Thank you. Hold on, I'm trying to find my screen. Are you seeing it? I'm seeing watch now from the Mid Penn Media Center. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me stop. Now? Now I'm seeing the two minutes on the timer. Okay, perfect. Go ahead, Lam. Lom? Did we lose Lom? I don't know. Uh, I am here. Uh, you, can, you can start. Yes, I have begun. Uh, Mikhail, please begin spe speaking. Okay, thank you. Hello, commissioners and Parks and Rec staff and City Council Member Ko. Um, I'd like to bring up the topic of Palo Alto dog owners um, associations desire for an off-leash hours pilot program to determine if such a program can work at any park in Palo Alto. When an off-leash pi um, hours pilot program was proposed at Ramus Park recently, one of the things that came up was why off-leash hours instead of an unclosed proper dog park? Well, there's a long history behind this, and of course, most dog owners would love an enclosed, dedicated dog park in every neighborhood. The reason is that um, this multi-purpose use of the area in a park would not require adjacent homeowners to disclose such details to prospective buyers, thereby potentially affecting a future sale. There's also increased noise concerns with a dedicated dog park. Um, a pilot program is reversible. The costs are minimal the promise of frequent reviews for the pilot uh, for any adverse impacts may alleviate some concerns. Current budget cuts make a fenced dog park very low priority. Um, putting a dedicated dog park is seen as a no turning ire of at least a few significant voices and, and would probably be voted down as has happened so many times in the past. Um, a dog park is also generally known to others and posted on city websites. Neighbors often fear it will increase traffic and parking issues. 
I'm not convinced of this, but we can assure people that an off-leash program can work under the radar and be generally known just for locals. Um, that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Cooper Phillips to be followed by Joel Gartland. Uh, please unmute uh, Cooper if you may proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening, my name is Cooper Phillips. I am 10 years old and in fourth grade. I would like the city of Palo Alto to not use any pesticides. Last fall, I was on a family walk and noticed a yard sign about being pesticide free. Their website is www.pesticidefreezone.org. I talked with my family about what that meant to be pesticide free and why it is so important. I shared the information with my classmates. We got some yard signs for our yard and gave some to classmates who had pesticide free yards so they could get more attention to the importance of not using pesticides. Then I wrote letters to our Palo Alto mayor, Governor Newsom and President Biden. Thank you for not using very many pesticides currently. I know the city has reduced its pesticide use by almost 90% over the past 20 years. This is wonderful. I encourage you to take the next step and become 100% pesticide free. Here's why. Pesticides are very dangerous to people and animals and the environment. They can cause cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and birth defects. Here are some alternatives. Copper can be used. It deters unwanted animals like slugs and snails. Fences and nets can keep squirrels and birds away. On weeds, you can use vinegar, handweed, and mulch to prevent weeds from go growing. You can also plant dense ground cover to prevent weed growth. Palo Alto has really great parks. Please keep them safe for people and animals by eliminate, eliminating all pesticide use. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. Our next speaker will, and final speaker will be Joel Gartland. Joel, uh, if you would please unmute on your end and you can begin. Am I audible? Yes, you are. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, in March, um, I emailed the commission asking why gate D between her Astro Preserve and uh, Foothills Preserve was closed to people on bicycles when it's legal to ride uh, to both sides of the gate. Darren sent me some information from 2005 when the decision was made, some city council minutes and a memo. And these discuss the Arasadero Gateway acquisition and cons conservation easement and the creation of the two new entrances to, to the preserve, one from Arasadero and one from mid Pence Los Trancos. Uh, given that Los Trancos is currently closed to people on bikes, it made sense that that entrance was limited to walkers. But was not, what was not discussed in, those, in that information was why Gate D between Arasadero and Front Foothills was limited to foot traffic. And hoping, I'm hoping this can be changed, so I think it's important to understand why this was made, why, why this decision was made. But it wasn't discussed in those uh, documents at all. So... I'm asking again, is there any historic knowledge of knowledge on the commission why this gate was closed to people riding when we can legally ride uh, to literally both sides of the gate? And it, is, there, is it better to advocate with you folks or directly to the city council to change it? Uh, your agenda's third item of business is Foothills uh, update. So I'm hoping this is a broad enough topic that it'll allow you to discuss this even for just a few minutes. And if it's not, um, maybe let me know how I could get it on the agenda for a future dis topic of discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. And Chair Cribs, that concludes oral communications. Well, I thank you very much, Lam, um, and thanks to the members of the public who took the time to come and speak. I'd like to especially thank Cooper um, for his very um, wise remarks. So thank you, Cooper. and. Um, now, uh, Darren, if we could move to the department report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Darren Anderson with the Community Services Department. Start with a friendly reminder to please fill out the, the demographic survey 
that was emailed to you on May 20th. It was sent to all board commission and committee members as part of citywide race and equity work. Uh, the city clerk's office informed me that the mayor has requested all board and commission work plans be sent to the clerk by the end of May and that they would go on the council consent calendar for June 21st. Uh, I believe our commission was one of the first in the city to complete the work plan, so uh, we will be sending that on the consent item. And I'll give you updates as I learn more about that. Uh, I emailed, or rather Catherine emailed an update on the Highway 101 pedestrian bike bridge project. They were planning on installing the 107 foot long prefabricated bridge over the center section of the freeway on Saturday the 29th. However, the contractor had a reschedule for June 5th or 6th. I was still working out and confirming the exact date. If you want more information on this project, you can visit the website cityofpaloalto.org forward slash 101 bridge. Little news on the Recreation Division. Uh, Rec, Rec Division and the Recreation Foundation will be hosting World Music Month. Uh, enjoy the sounds of music while you shop and dine on University and California Avenues. Music will be played on every Saturday and Sunday in June. And for times and more information, you can visit uh, parecfoundation.org. I did get, this is a, a rough teaser, I don't have any details, but Community Services Department will be holding an in-person event on July 4th. I'm um, sorry, that's so cryptic. That's all I got from recreation. So as I get more, of course, I'll keep you updated. Uh, Coverly has established uh, their expected reopening date. That will be Tuesday, July 13th, and we'll resume some limited rentals based on county and state guidelines at that time. Theater rentals may resume before that date, and they're opening up applications for the September 2021 through August 2022 rental season this week. Uh, field allocation for summer season has been established and we'll be holding our fall season brokering meetings mid-June. Summer camps start the week of June 7th and summer class registration opens on May 27th for residents and June 3rd for non-residents. And lastly, bear with me just a second, Chair Cribs if I asked if I would share a photo uh, from Mayfet, and tell me if you can see that screen. Thank you, Darren, very much. I just wanted to share this photo because it made me so happy today to go pick up the signs that uh, are of my grand dogs who occasionally reside with me in Palo Alto. And uh, the one on the left is uh, Harley and the one on the right is Jasper in their costumes all ready for the pet parade. I wanna thank the staff for the creativeness that everybody displayed and also the Palo Alto Recreation Foundation for the financial support. So. I brought a smile to my face and I wanted to share it with the commission. So thank you, Darren, for making that happen. I appreciate it. Most welcome. And that concludes the department report. Okay, so moving right along to the business of the, the day. Um, uh, uh, Chair, yes? can we ask questions? Oh, yes, would you like to ask questions, David? Yes, can you give us an update on the May FET uh, that happened? this past month? You know, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of details to share, but I'd be glad to send something out via email that I'll get from the Recreation Division. Yeah, it would be nice to know how many participated and, and that kind of thing, because it was so unique. Uh, I was really uh, impressed by it. Will do. David, there were lots of dog signs when I went to pick up mine today. There were two pickup times, one last week and one today. So there were a lot of dogs that participated. So that was good. Any other questions from other commissioners? Council Member Ku, do you have any comments, questions? No, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the update, Darren. Okay, so then we can move on to the draft minutes. And um, I wanted to point out, um, and maybe everybody saw that we're moving to a different kind of minutes that will just reflect the um, actions that were taken and, and the votes. And um, I was a little bit hesitant reading that because we lose a lot of the background, but then I realized that we will have the videos to go back and look at if we, um, and I guess they'll be posted for a long time, Darren, is that the plan? I believe so. Just stay part of the city record. Um, and I think 
I think that's a good thing to try out. So um, other comments from other commissioners, how did you feel about the minutes? I'd like the verbatim minutes because I can go back and I can do searches for words and remember when something was discussed and sometimes in a video, it takes a long time to, to listen to the whole thing, to hear the gist of it, but you can go back to the verbatim minutes and very quickly refresh your memory of what happened. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Was this a financial issue or we just thought this would be more concise? It was actually part of the new handbook as a direction from council. Okay. It, the draft minutes that we're seeing feel kind of extra light, and, and uh, certainly the the verbatim the verbatim minutes are very heavy uh, and in detail and uh, and length. And it'd be interesting to understand if there was some sort of a happy medium uh, that, that could provide a little bit more depth. Uh, as far as the minutes go. I agree. We can make a decision to do summary if that might be better for you guys. Yeah, I much prefer to see the, uh, uh, the verbatim uh, minutes. So if there's, if there's a way to still do the verbatim minutes, but send it to us alone, just to make sure that um, what we said was interpreted right. And also, yeah, it's a reminder of what we what we talked about. I, I Kath Catherine, could you elaborate on the uh, summary that you're just referring to? Um, it's basically what council does. So they do action minutes and summary minutes. They were actually surprised we were still doing verbatim minutes, but summary would give you more context to what was discussed, but not word for word. Because I, I know that I've, I've gone back to past minutes mm -hmm. a year ago uh, to see what, what was said back then and it was really valuable. Uh, so um, I think we're losing something. So how would you all feel about going to try the summary minutes along with the action minutes that we have right now and see how we feel about that. I mean, I, I as I said initially, it was, it was a little jarring to see the one page um, of action. So Darren, could we do that for a couple well, of months? Yeah, I think we can experiment with it. Um, there's a staff impact as well, but I think we can give it a, a fair shot and see how we do. and if it's effective at giving the commission what they need to. I'll double check with counts um, with the clerk's office because they did um, ask us what we are doing. They wanted a count of all the boards and commissions and what we were using because everybody uses Cyberterry to do this. So I'll check with them. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm curious if council and putting together the, the BCC handbook had intended it to be just uh, action minutes or was intending to have summary minutes included as well. But I hadn't really comprehended the difference between the two and in reviewing more recent city council minutes was expecting something similar. And I'm wondering if that may have been the intent of it, of, of the council when, when they approved the BCC handbook. And council member Pooh, I don't know if you have any comment on that. No, I don't know if that was the intention uh, either, although I've always valued verbatim minutes myself. Um, so <laughs> I, um, I didn't kind of go along with that, but. Mm. <laughs> so the recordings that are being made, um, they're hard to, to uh, go back to. I don't even know how to do it really. So having the verbatim minutes was all I had. And when I first started on the commission, we had the summary minutes. And one of the reasons we went to verbatim is that Kat was spending a lot of time determining the summary and summarizing what we said and then mm -hmm. putting it together. And we just thought it was much better, uh, both from a staff standpoint and an accuracy standpoint, just to have verbatim minutes. I think if we go to summary minutes, the discussion period 
in reviewing minutes will be more active than it traditionally is where the want to make the com commissioners may have comments to confirm uh, that some nuances may, may have been included or, or left out of the uh, summary minutes. So that's something else to consider. It, I, I think overall it'd be, it'd be great to understand, to get clarity on, on what council's intention is for the, the commissions and then and see if that if we can make that work and, and otherwise uh, work to adapt and figure out what's best moving forward and make a recommendation. Okay, I'll check on it. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. And a second. And I a second. second it. Was that David? I second it. Thank you very much. And uh, Catherine, can you do a, a vote, please? Yes. Commissioner Brown? I was not here, but maybe. Oh, abstain. Okay. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner Lemaire? Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Abstain. Four to approve the minutes. C Commissioner Rectal, would you like to explain the reason why you have abstained? Oh, <laughs> I was busy doing something other than uh, park stuff last month, so. Right, you weren't here as well. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. I I apologize for that, but it happens. It was important. <laughs> it, it, it was other city work, so. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was important. Okay, so uh, we know what we're doing with the minutes going forward. And Catherine, would you let us know what people, what the clerk's office says, and if we hear anything I, I, from the council as well? Yes, I will. Okay, so that was a good discussion. Um, the next thing on the agenda is the ad hoc committee and liaison updates. Um, and we went to this format, suggested it last, I believe last month or maybe at our retreat, I'm not remembering quite yet, but um, I had thought that we were gonna send out a um, written opportunity to respond about what the ad hocs were doing and then take a couple of minutes at our at our meeting to um, see if anybody wanted to add anything so that other commissioners could see what was going on. So um, that didn't happen and I didn't catch that. So um, today, if we could just uh, go around and if you have anything to report um, from your ad hoc, um, we can do that and if commissioners have any questions, I believe that would be okay to discuss the questions. Am I right, Darren? Yes. Okay, good. So let's start with um, uh, the in alphabetical order, the Balin's tide gate. Um, commissioners Greenfield and Rectal, anything to report? No status update there waiting for uh, Valley Waters board to approve things so we can move forward. Okay, good. Um, Chair, Chair, I've just got a brief update on that. I, I believe Valley Waters Board did approve it and got an email that they are planning on bringing the park improvement ordinance to our June meeting. Oh, okay. I mean, Chair and Vice Chair are, are okay with having that on the agenda. Yeah, I am. Vice Chair, are you okay with that? Absolutely. Good, okay, good report. Um, the CIP review, any status update? Uh, we definitely heard from um, Lamb, um, uh, but it's been, I can't remember if it was uh, this bump or just before the previous um, meeting, um, but there, is there one more, um, uh, milestone where the um, commission or the city council is supposed to uh, meet one more time sometime in the next week or two um, to do a final final on that 
FDIP budget. And Chair, if you don't mind, just a little bit of information on that. The Finance Committee did their uh, budget wrap up today. Mm -hmm. And so their recommendation will be sent to council and it's June 21st, I believe. Uh, the council will be reviewing operating capital budget. Great, any other, any other comments? Okay, hearing none, um, we move on to dog parks and restrooms. Mandy, any update from you? have no updates since my last, well, last time I was here. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So um, we're working with um, the staff to schedule um, another meeting um, of the dog park situation. So that'll be coming up, but with all the budget hearings and all of the other meetings, uh, we've not gotten to it yet. Darren, anything to add to that? Perfect. Okay, fund development. Um, we did not meet, um, but as the liaison for um, the Park and Recreation Foundation, I attended their, um, I think it's been every two week meetings um, and learned about the support that they're providing for um, community service programs, including the May Fate and the upcoming uh, World Music um, festivals and whatever is going to happen on the 4th of July. Jeff isn't here, but Mandy, anything to add? Oh, I just asked you that. Never mind. Um, the, la the next one is Foothill Policy, Commissioner Greenfield, Moss, or Olson. Any updates? Yeah, we had a very long meeting. Um, <laughs> in preparation for the presentation that we're giving today. And on top of that, um, we have started the process of, of uh, what, kind, what research we're going to be doing for the end of summer and the end of the year. So uh, this, is an, this is definitely an ongoing uh, process and we have another meeting planned uh, this coming month. Thank you. Thank you. I know how hard all of you are working and how much time everybody's spending on this. So thank you for that. Um, Vice Chair, anything to add? Uh, just that we're, we're focusing on the, the leftover priorities uh, based on our, the last time we went to the commission. And, and highlighted uh, specific areas that we'd be focusing on. So we're looking at these and figuring out the, the most expedient way to move forward on uh, items that we can move forward on. Okay, good. And Commissioner Olson? Uh, nothing else to add, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Racket court policy, uh, Commissioner Rectal or Commissioner Olson? Uh, nothing to report. No updates. Okay, and the last one is um, new recreational opportunities. And I would just start and say that most of our time has been spent this last month um, talking about the skate park. And uh, we have two really good meetings with staff who provided really excellent um, information about potential location and potential design. The next step will be meeting with um, Sam and his colleagues um, to hear exactly what they would like to see in a skateboard park um, and potential locations, which is gonna drive the cost. Um, so it's exciting and I think we're moving forward. Um, Commissioner LaMare is not here yet. Um, Commissioner Rechtel, anything to add to that? No, it's a good summary. Okay, thank you. Well. Um, I really appreciate everybody um, speaking up and talking about their own ad hocs. It's really helpful to hear what the other ad hocs are doing. Um, so thank you all for that. And we can kind of review and see if this method works or we wanna go back to the written reports um, or there's a um, hybrid thing of doing both. So we can discuss that next, next time, next meeting, unless anybody has specific thoughts right now about that. 
I do have a couple of liaison updates to add as well. Your Go lecture. Ahead. Good. Uh, regarding safe routes on last Friday, May 21st was bike to wherever day. Uh, mm -hmm. This is replacing the tradi more traditional bike to work day uh, as uh, transportation habits have changed over the past year. There was a modification. It was nice to uh, get in a, it's an annual event to encourage commitment to bicycle transportation. It's nice to see that uh, out and happening back in the streets and there were some city staff and uh, members of the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition out in force uh, handing out bags. Uh, also, there's a South Palo Alto Bikeways project that's underway. Uh, it's, it's a conceptual plan development targeted to end uh, by, the, by August of this year. It includes a survey. Uh, there's a meeting a virtual route tour this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, that'll be repeated on May 22nd. And there's a, a summary meeting coming on June 22nd. Uh, this does include a linkage to the 101 bike pedestrian bridge, hmm. uh, which, is, which will be very nice. And if anybody's interested in more, interest, in, in more information on this, you can go to the city website and just search for South Palo Alto bikeways and find out, figure out where to go from there. Also, uh, as field users liaison, we're continuing work on new signage for Coverly turf field and uh, running track. There's some questionnaires about the, what the specific guidelines should be. Uh, so I'll be meeting with staff uh, soon to discuss this further. And that's all. Um, Jeff, are the lights still being used at night or are they done now that it's daylight savings time? The lights are gone. They are a, a daylight savings uh, time uh, item, and we, and they're they're not necessary uh, when daylight savings is once we switch over to daylight savings. Okay, great. Any other liaison reports? Okay, hearing none. I think we can move on then to the foothill nature preserve update. All right, Chair, thank you so much. Um, good evening, Commissioners. Darren Anderson again from Community Services. We've got some special guests helping present this item on the Foothills Nature Preserve update this evening. We have Park Ranger Catherine Caldwell, who will provide you an update on visitation at the preserve. Alex Von Feld, our Executive Director from Grassroots Ecology, will be talking to us about environmental monitoring efforts at the preserve. And Elliot Wright, Executive Director with environmental volunteers who will tell you about an exciting new video on Foothills Preserve that the environmental volunteers and a lot of other wonderful volunteers helped create, as well as a new program that the city and the environmental volunteers are collaborating on called the Trail Ambassador Program. Rather than reiterate a lot of information that was in the staff report uh, on this topic, the majority of the presentation is gonna focus on our guest speakers uh, and providing plenty of time for the commission to ask questions to those speakers. And I'd like to thank our guests for being uh, here tonight and presenting and to acknowledge them and all the participants on the stakeholder group. As I noted in the staff report, the city manager assembled a stakeholder group in January, 2021 to identify and recommend potential improvements at Foothills Nature Preserve. And the group has representatives from Grassroots Ecology, Friends of Foothills Park, the Environmental Volunteers, Stanford University Haas Center for Public Service, Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve, the town of Los Altos Hills and our very own chair and vice chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Very grateful for all of your support. They've been giving so much of their time and energy um, and just wanted to send that sincere thanks. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Catherine Caldwell to provide some information on, on Foothills visitation. Hi, good evening, I'm Catherine Caldwell. I am the acting uh, supervisor for Foothills. I also, um, uh, kind of run and analyze our statistics program. So I uh, collect all the statistics that we get. And then at the yearly, in a yearly memo, I um, present this to Darren and let him know exactly what we've been up to for the year. Um, so far, uh, it has been uh, ex um, much busier than we used to be. We're seeing very increased visitation uh, given um, that we are now open to a much wider uh, population. 
So, so far we've had about 124,000 guests in the park so far uh, in our first four months of operation. So from January through April. And when you measure this against 2020, this was a 322% increase from the same period of time. So we're seeing a lot of people and that number is a little skewed because we, of course, were closed and severely limited due to the outbreak of COVID-19. But if you still compare this against the historical average, we're up 193%, uh, almost you know, three times as busy as we've had in the past. Um, we have had closures for capacity. It was very common during the first four months of operation. We would have closed for 16 times. Uh, on the weekends, we were sometimes closing two or three times a day due to reaching capacity when visitors came. So we were shutting down the park and waiting for people to leave and then reopening. And we were still reaching our full capacity for that time. And it took a while to kind of get that tuned to where we were only doing that once. And now we haven't had um, any kind of closure due to capacity except for our last one was on April 5th, which was our Easter weekend. And we expected that to be busy. Um, we have been able to, since we started selling passes, um, we've had admitted 13,000 cars on weekends. That includes all kinds of entries. Only 725 of those have been our annual pass program, which make up the vast majority of the um, free, free entries for the park. These are just not charged at the, at the main entrance booth. So they make up 5% of, about 5.5% of all total weekend entry. And it's been a growing program. It's become very popular. Um, and then the all other types of uh, free passes only count for 1.5%. So that includes students, veterans, um, people with ABA placards and uh, active military uh, don't charge an entry for, and that's about one and a half percent of our total. Um, being open to more people, we have had a lot more dog turnaways uh, in the recent past. We've had 533 dog turnaways that we've recorded during the weekends from January through April. And in the same period of 2020, it was only four, it was only 47. And when you compare that with even the historical average, that's still almost a 2000% increase in just people bringing their dogs to the park and being a little unfamiliar with our particular rules there. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So these are our, um, specific numbers that you can see here that were included in the staff report. Um, if there are any further questions on this, we can always refer to the slide to get the, the exact numbers here. And if we can move on to our last slide, this is a sort of an impact to what this increased visitation has for our ranger and OST staff at the park. So, so far in 2021, we've responded to 15 calls for service. Calls for service include anything that has us going through our dispatch or needing to write a report. And these include everything from our emergency medical response, missing persons, violations of park rules, responding to fire calls, smoke checks. This is what um, we go out and do and document our response in taking care of the park and managing all the things that go on in the park. And we've um, seen a significant increase in that. From our historical average, we're up 50% from this same period. And this is, um, this is a lot more work for our ranger staff writing these reports. Uh, one of our most common uh, violations that we've been dealing with and complaints has been parking. We've recorded over 200 parking violations, and this goes far and above anything we've ever recorded as far as parking violations, which can be less than um, a, a two-digit number, less than 10 in a given year. But we've issued 175 written warnings that we've recorded for people being parked in red zones, uh, people being parked in parts of the um, park, like just into the road and other no parking kind of areas. And 27 of these, uh, the ranger decided to issue an administrative citation uh, as a method, which includes a lot of um, backtracking to, for the administrative citation process. Each of those takes about uh, 45 minutes to an hour to complete the full report for. Uh, and if our entrance operations now are composed, are very focused on operating the main entrance at Foothills. Normally in previous years, it could be run with as few as one staff member. Now it takes about three to five staff members just to operate it safely because we have to do the cash handling very carefully to make sure that we're doing it uh, properly. We have to maintain safety for the road because uh, we have a very small 
uh, turn away from the park. So you'll have a lot of people who can back up on the page mill on a hairpin turn. And with a lot of people, um, that becomes a very unsafe turn. So we want to move that line as quickly as we can while still maintaining the cash handling. And of course, all of these extra people require a bit more visitor services attention, a lot more orientating of people to the trails, which requires another staff member's attention. And usually we want to be able to give these people breaks. So right now to safely and efficiently operate, um, we require about three to five members. And this goes beyond right now our staffing with rangers for the weekends. We've been having a lot of support from other members of CSD who are using their time on their weekends to assist us with staffing. And of course, uh, Council Member Cormac has volunteered her time quite generously to support our operations up there. Um, with all of this, this means our attention on Arastradera, which is a responsibility of our office, and even Foothills has been severely limited with all of our attention focused really at that uh, main uh, entrance. Rangers are often not getting out to check on the parks and just do those uh, proactive patrols. We're mainly reactive and staying in that booth and making sure that our staff is looked after and providing a point of contact for the public. So patrols of our other preserves have become severely limited on the weekends and a lot of those responsibilities have been pushed further into the week. Um, that includes our responsibilities of our OSTs are now focused almost entirely on weekend operations and they have less hours to operate during the middle of the week to do other kind of park improvement projects or maintenance projects. And of course, with increased uh, use of the park, we've seen our janitorial costs increase. And that also includes increase due to the cost of COVID sanitation and maintenance and increased, uh, excuse me, sanitation requirements there. But we have a lot, had a lot more supplies increase that we anticipated with um, more people in the park needing use of our limited facilities more often. And that um, concludes sort of a uh, snapshot of what uh, the last four months at the park have been like for staff. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, building on Catherine's information, I know that many of the commissioners were interested in annual pass sales. We pulled this information. This is uh, up to May 14th. Total of 482 annual passes have been sold. And you can see for yourself the breakdown on residents versus non-residents. And we'll, um, fortunately, this is, was a really easy one to query where recreation staff could pull this information uh, really efficiently and quickly because we use our own system uh, for the sales for the annual passes. We can come back to this if there's more questions. But at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Alex von Feltz to talk about environmental uh, update. Alex? Thanks, Darren. Uh, so when uh, last fall, uh, when the city decided that they were gonna remove the restriction, um, Darren, uh, you know, reached out to us to figure out what we could do for um, environmental impact monitoring. And uh, Grassroots Ecology is the, um, we're the organization nonprofit that um, stewards the site, um, all with you know, community volunteers, and we provide a lot of that sort of that knowledge. And so knowing that there wasn't any extra budget, we tried to figure out what we could do within um, our current staffing. And so some of the, um, the measures that you'll see today or what we can do and given our current budget. So they don't reflect an exhaustive um, environmental impact monitoring that you might see on a bigger project. So that being said, um, the main impacts that we've seen probably aren't too surprising. I mean, it's mainly the trail widening that's been happening in a few places, primarily the Chemise Trail that goes from Vista Point um, to the lake because that was such a popular place for people to park and want to go and, and see the lake. So you can see in those photos between January and April some of, some of the impact there. Um, the good news is that uh, no, none of the special habitat areas that we've been monitoring have been impacted. Um, and you know we as the some of the attendance is kind of going down a bit, we're keeping an eye on these areas to see whether invasive species come in or if the, um, if the land kind of heals itself. Next slide, please. Thanks. Oops. There we go. And then there was also a lot of social trails happening. That basically means when people were making their own trails from the parking lot down to the lake again. And you can see again in January what that was looking like. But um, the, the park staff put up some, you know, the yellow caution tape and a lot of signs. And you can see that uh, people pretty much adhered to that. So that, um, that social trail was healed by April. So that's great news. 
The other part that we were going to be looking at um, were the invasive species, because that's always been, you know, Foothills uh, Nature Preserve is so remarkable for the biological diversity of this in the park. And so the Friends of Foothills started this and we've continued where we're really controlling a non-native invasive plants. So we want to make sure that, you know, they aren't coming in more often with, with more visitors. But it's still, by the time we were doing this report, uh, some of the target species that we're looking for, including yellow star thistle, Italian thistle, um, and, and trichia haven't um, been, uh, haven't germinated yet. So we're gonna be keeping an eye on that and we'll provide more updates as we go forward. And one of our um, main species um, that in the park that's rare is called the Durka occidentalis or the Western leatherwood. And um, so we were concerned, you know, that this uh, might be impacted, but uh, we've been mapping um, the, the locations of this plant as we have in previous years. And it looks like there's no impact and even new plants were, were coming up. So that was good news as well. And then finally, um, you know, what, again, what, how we've been stewarding Foothills is basically bringing out just tons of volunteers every year to remove non-native invasive species, install native plants, and also learn about the local ecology. And while we had to suspend our usual model, which is like every Sunday, you know, 30 to 40 students come out and they, um, they do it. We had to suspend that model for, for COVID because of, um, you know, the limited group size and things like that. But we still were able to go out with um, stable cohorts, we call them, of, of high school students, middle school students, and college interns um, every week. And we had four different sessions, summer, fall, winter, spring, of um, 10 to 12 students each time that would come, the same students would come every week. So they really learned a lot about, um, about Foothills. And then they also helped us, as you can see, with some planting, some mulching, so remo removing invasive species. And um, the college interns that shadowed our staff really got, um, did a lot of great work, provided, I've seen total about 500 hours of, of volunteer labor for the, for the park. Alex, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the whole grassroots ecology team for the excellent work they do and just such wonderful partners. Thank you very, very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Elliot Wright uh, from, environmental volunteers. And Elliot's going to start with the video. Only catch here is I've got to switch screens. So bear with me while I um, stop the share and share another screen. But Elliot, if you'd like to talk a little bit before I uh, pull up the video, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. And, and thank you, Chair and, and everyone. I'm so excited to see you all. Um, we are environmental volunteers. Uh, we inspire a love of science and nature. And I don't think we've come before the commission before, so I, I'm excited to, to share with you a bit about what we've been doing and, um, and to start off with a, a bit of accolades for the whole team in rallying around the 124,000 visitors that came and had a safe, fun, and meaningful visit at the Foothills Nature Preserve. So you're watching the world debut on our three-minute film of the... Uh, uh, visiting Foothills Nature Preserve. The purpose of this film, the audience that we've intended is, is really anybody who's curious about coming up and seeing the preserve. We wanted, to, we wanted to first really say welcome to everyone who wants to come up and see this amazing place. We also wanted to sort of lay out some of the neat opportunities that are there and quickly list some of the uh, do's and don'ts or the, the places where we want to be mindful uh, when we come up to the preserve. So without further ado, the film. <laughs> Foothills Nature Preserve is a special place welcoming of all. This nature preserve contains a remarkable diversity of life. It is home to important grasslands, chaparral, oak woodlands, mixed evergreen forest, and freshwater wetlands. All of this makes Foothills a wonderful resource for all community members to visit while offering a place of refuge for native plants and animals. 
The 1400 acre preserve is located just a few miles up Page Mill Road from 280. If you're planning to visit, watch this video to plan a safe, fun, and meaningful trip and learn a few tips on things to look for and new trail suggestions. It's all right, Darren. Uh, it's a it, it'll it's a it's a great video. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, you try again? Oh, let's see if this one works. In order for everyone to enjoy their experience, we need your help. At Foothills Nature Preserve, we are focused on leave no trace principles, and we want all of our visitors to recreate responsibly. Here are the main leave no trace principles to remember. Plan ahead and prepare. Stay on marked trails, park only in designated parking areas. Dispose of waste properly. Always leave what you find. Respect and do not chase or harass wildlife. Always be considerate of other visitors. Hills Nature Preserve is at capacity. Do not park illegally outside the preserve as you will be sighted and towed. Hazards like ticks, poison oak, and rattlesnakes are common at Foothills Nature Preserve. <laughs> We hope to see you at Foothills soon. Great. Thanks so much, Darren. Uh, hey, cheers to all of you. Um, the, uh, the exciting thing is th this was our attempt at sort of, uh, you know, Yosemite quality when you visit the park, here's a few things to think if you're coming, you know, coming to see the Foothills Nature Preserve. I am excited about uh, how we're going to get the word out from tonight about this. I think that we have a great opportunity to welcome even more people um, in the in the last uh, several months of this year, and particularly through some of the busy months of summer. Um, so, if we could go to the next slide. I'll detail a little bit about the Trail Ambassador Program. Really the focus of this is to try to train our on the needs that Catherine listed in her report on challenges that rangers are feeling. And so the focus of the Trail Ambassador Program is to try to meet with folks that are coming up to the preserve who have questions and to try to help out with those common questions such that the, the rangers get a little bit more freedom to achieve their goals for the day. And so we focused our efforts to bring um, trail ambassador leaders to uh, a few sites. Some are walking volunteers throughout the preserve. Others are situated at nature discovery tables at the peak volume times on the weekends. We're focused now We've, we've had Saturdays since the beginning of the year, since January to present. We've had, I see a typo here, I'll correct. We've had conversations with about 1,792 visitors. And then apparently we've had a, a several more with some of our walking volunteers. But on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 to 2, if you come up to Lake Barona, you'll see our table. This is uh, decidedly not a, a ranger appearance. We don't have the, 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 the officialness of a ranger uniform. We have what looks to be a, 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 a nature volunteer uniform. We have our vests on, we have our name tags on, and we're sort of excitedly sharing demonstration materials on our, on our dis nature discovery tables. So a lot of the folks who come up have common questions about hours or trails, how to, how to park, 
um, simple questions that we can answer. And then they also kind of dive in and get into some of the questions about what they're gonna see and experience on their hikes. This feels like a great opportunity for us to kind of build the cup that people will then fill with the water from that day. So if you build that cup of curiosity, people get really excited about what they're experiencing on their nature, on their nature trip. And then they get excited about coming back or they get excited about posting it up on iNaturalist and, um, and, and then re-engaging with us in the future. So the goal is actually to grow this program. And in many ways, we have to give credit to um, uh, our, our council member McCormick who, who's already out there volunteering a huge amount of her time uh, helping to guide people into uh, the right parking spots or just help have safe, fun, meaningful experiences up at Foothill Nature Preserve. And, uh, but really it's to kind of create maybe 50 to 60 volunteers who are at the ready to help out in uh, peak moments, but also on common weekends going forward. Um, so we're, we've got a, on this slide, uh, I, a list for the the location of the link where we're going to have a posting to join us to become volunteers and to get excited about helping out at Foothills Nature Preserve. Um, as we mentioned, this is a partnership. We want to link arms together to help out with Foothill, Foothill Nature Preserve. So these are not volunteers exclusive to any one group, but they, they have interests. So if they have an interest, say, for example, in restoration, we'll point them in the direction for grassroots ecology to work with them. If they have an interest in simply helping out with the nature discovery table or being a roving trail ambassador, we're gonna be able to help them with that. Or with um, Friends of Foothill Park, uh, getting out the yellow star thistle, we'll be excited to engage them in that. Um, so I'll just stop there and say thank you. It's been uh, an honor to work with you all and to work with the committee, uh, environment committee and the people's committee. And I'm really excited, Anne, to work with you. So thank you so much. Elliot, thank you very much. And, and I want to pass on that same sincere gratitude to the entire environmental volunteers team, and especially uh, Mr. White, the docent who comes up on Saturdays and, and donates his time and does such a terrific job of engaging with the visitors. Thank you. Uh, another initiative from the stakeholder group was to create a list of infrastructure improvements aimed at protecting the habitat, improving visitor safety and the visitor experience. And the group working on this topic met and walked and toured the preserve um, on several occasions discussing possible improvements. And some of those improvements included split rail fencing to help encourage visitors to stay on trail. And I'll show you some photos um, that help illustrate that. Um, creating a pedestrian pathway through the preserve to allow visitors to avoid walking on the road. That was really evident right in the beginning as cars were parking everywhere it just wasn't a great place for people to walk. And historically, when the use was so low, they could just use the main park road, and that's no longer appropriate. Better defined parking spaces with crosswalks and speed bumps to improve pedestrian safety, and additional signage were the, the main items called out. And so when I mentioned this group has walked we, the site, come up with this list, and we put pen to paper and have a really crude drawing that needs to be refined professionally so that we can ultimately submit this as part of a design package to get approving, approval from planning to make this happen. And once I get to that level, I'll of course bring this to the Parks and Rec Commission for your feedback and, and opinions and thoughts before we move much further beyond that. And this is a photo um, where the fencing is. So you can see on the left, we've got this temporary fencing, which is caution tape and tea stakes that was surprisingly effective, although not labor free. The rangers spent a lot of time putting it up and to maintain it, they've got to come out periodically and fix the tape and, and make sure, but it has been effective. Um, we're really grateful that people saw those and by and large have respected it, staying out of those natural areas. What we want to replace this unsightly caution tape and tea stakes with is the very attractive split rail fencing that you see on the right. This is at the entrance to the Foothills Nature Preserve, and we've got it in numerous places throughout uh, Foothills and Pearson-Rastadero Preserve. 
And this, this next slide's an example um, where we have some of the parking that we wanted to address, that is cars parking in such a spot on the narrow road where there's no spot space for pedestrians to walk. It also is illustrative of where we want that pedestrian pathway. For the most part, it's just off the edge of the road where oftentimes there already is a fairly worn area, but right now, or at least in the past, until the Rangers made some improvements, peak cars would park there. So it just wasn't suitable. And what the infrastructure group has proposed is adding some curbing um, along, right along the edge of the road, and then formalizing that trail with a safe, durable, accessible pathway for visitors to use. And as much as possible, have that throughout the entire preserve. So you've got that opportunity to walk safely out of harm's way from the, the vehicles. As I mentioned, staff's working on developing the conceptual plan set. From there, we'll have some cost estimates and work on a funding source for this proposal and ultimately bring this to the, the commission for your feedback. Uh, the next steps we've got are the June uh, 2021. This will be the date that staff sometime this coming month will remove those nine hillside barbecues. This is something that the commission had recommended and council approved um, for fire safety reasons. And it's just a matter of staff availability and time to remove them, but we'll make time in June. And right now, all those hillside barbecues are bagged, so no one's using them. Um, so we, we're still um, meeting our fire safety, but we want to remove them so that we don't tempt folks. Uh, June 24th, that adopted ordinance that council approved on May 10th will take effect. And on August 21st, um, I hope to be bringing approximately around that time frame those infrastructure improvements uh, for your review from the PRC. And that concludes the staff presentation, Chair. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, I just love to say that, first of all, I'm really excited to see the progress that everybody's made um, and congratulations to everybody. Um, secondly, I'm very excited about the relationships and partnerships that have been developed with the community groups and with the um, environmental groups. And I think it's gonna serve Palo Alto very well in the future. So I'm really pleased about that and looking forward to see, hearing the next steps. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who participated in the presentation and to the video folks too. Um, I love the video and I think it, it will serve the purpose that we want to have it serve. So just a few comments. Can we now go to any members of the public who would like to speak before we go to the commissioners to, uh, for questions and comment? Lam, could you help with any members of the public who wish to speak? Chair Cribs, at this moment, there are no requests for uh, to any members of the public to speak. Okay, well, thank you very much. So we can go to um, the commissioners and maybe start with- Chair, them. we just have a hand raised. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. So thanks for letting me know, go ahead. That's all right. Um, would you like, uh, we'll go with the two minutes again? Um, yes, please. Okay, and uh, my colleague will set up our timer and then we'll, um, our one speaker and final speaker on, Middle Nature Preserve will be Joel Gartland. Joel, give me a moment here, and if you would, I will allow you to unmute, and I'll, I will cue you when to begin. Hey, Lom, if we're having a problem with the timer, I can just time it on my phone and, and give them a heads up. You could just go ahead and start uh, the public speaker. Thank you, Darren. Joel, if you would unmute and please proceed. Uh, 
Am I audible? Yes, you are. I just, I would just like to reiterate my request for a few minutes discussion about gate D between Fodales and Arasadero, just so I can get a commissioner's, the commission's take on that gate. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so I don't see any more hands, Lam. So if um, there are none that anybody else can see, we can go ahead and go to the commissioners and maybe start with the ad hoc committee. And I can start. Um, I am so excited about our partners. Yes. We could not possibly do this without them. The budget issues that we are facing are uh, monumental and to have these two events happening simultaneously is just uh, uh, way beyond. And uh, so I really appreciate all of the volunteer work and not only that, but um, when Catherine Caldwell mentioned that uh, we have so few, we need so many more Rangers, three to five instead of one to two, they're coming not just from Arastrodero, but also from the Baylands. So um, we, even though we don't have the money, we still have to spend uh, uh, staff time to keep uh, the place safe and clean. So I take my hat off to, to uh, staff um, for doing this in spite of all of the budget issues uh, and the city council is doing what they can. I'm also very pleased to see the number of annual passes that are being sold. I'd like to see 10 times that many, but I'm, uh, I think over the summer, uh, we will have, there will be more sold. Um, the other thing is that I saw with all the dog uh, turnaways turn away, that this is a major uh, issue and anything we can do to um, uh, to give people a heads up. And I really appreciate the video from uh, environmental volunteers where they mentioned that. And uh, I'd like to put stars and asterisks around, around those um, that because it is such a big issue. Um, and as far as the grassroots ecology, looking at uh, for invasive species and and dealing with social trails, uh, we have to do that. And they're doing a fantastic job. And the best thing they're doing is in spite of the, in spite of the COVID and not being able to have their usual work parties, they still managed to come up with a, uh, a cadre of what she called stable interns, which is just a fantastic thing and uh, very, um, uh, really terrific and I hope we can keep that up for forever um, and I'd like to see um, not only um, I'd, I'd like to even see them uh, volunteer to give tours at 2 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays leaving from Baranda Lake and walking around I think guided tours would be really terrific but you need the volunteers. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Oh, there's one other thing. And that is that I went to a Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve uh, meeting and they had uh, someone from the, uh, they called it the Santa, uh, Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network and also the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and they're trying to do a stewardship assessment. And the big thing about this is that they need test cases. They need uh, what we're going through to help other organizations throughout the Santa Cruz mountains to better deal with, with the issues that we're dealing with. We are a test case. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Commissioner Olson. Hi everyone. Um, well, Catherine, I want to thank you for all of that <clears throat> data that's been gathered by your team. It is incredibly helpful when we are 
uh, in the ad hoc, trying to, you know, prioritize things to, to sort of see how the data is coming out. Because I know we've all visited the park and we have our own sort of, you know, experiences there, but having that data that's been aggregated over time is really invaluable. Um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to um, camp at the park the weekend before this last one as well. So I get to spend a lot of time out there and um, was so impressed with the, the rangers who were there and just their, their way of approaching people and how, um, you know, what a wonderful staff that we um, have there. And so just am incredibly grateful. Um, and I'll also say, you know, kind of before I had spent a whole weekend out there, you know, I knew grassroots ecology had done a lot, environmental volunteers did a lot out there. But when you really see all the people on the ground and how it all comes together, it's just so impressive. Um, you know, I went out in the morning on uh, Saturday and saw the volunteers out there picking out, you know, amongst the grasses. And I came back much later and they're still all hunched over picking out grasses. And I was like, oh, wow, that is some hard work. <laughs> so just um, thank you so much for getting folks together and doing something that's so valuable to the community. And um, I, I really appreciate that. I got to, to got dragged over to the discovery table as well by my my kids who were just fascinated by the the eggs and the skins of the snakes and things. So um, definitely encourage everyone uh, listening to this, get out there and really enjoy it. And you don't all need to come between 10 and two. There are lots of other open hours at the park. Uh, <laughs> you get there early, you get there later, you won't have the problems with parking that you'll have in the middle of the day. So I um, would encourage people to spread out their visit as well. So thanks everyone for the, for the presentation today and um, really love that video, Elliot. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Good comments, Vice Chair. Thank you. I, I wanna uh, continue in, in the same vein as the other commissioners and really thank the, the stakeholders, partners that uh, we, we have helping us out. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have the, the key partners we have in grassroots ecology and in environmental volunteers. It's, it's an outstanding service to our community. And, and it, equally and, and, and more effusive thanks for, for the ranger staff that's really had to jump through a lot of hoops uh, since the, in, in the past number of months since, since the park has opened. Uh, there's been lots of work happening in, in many spheres in a, in a short amount of time. And uh, it, it, it's, it's great to hear the data that was very useful. It, it feels like we're on the right track, uh, not without much ado. And we'll wait and see what happens this, this summer uh, as we expect visitation to increase and continue, continue to adapt as needed. Uh, but it, 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 is very, it is very encouraging. Uh, it's great to see the, the annual passes uh, working out. Uh, there's lot, lot, lots of things we, lot, lots of details to, to work to, to sort out, uh, but lots of people working together to, to make it happen. And, and that's very encouraging. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And, and um, certainly all of our thanks to the ad hoc for all the extra work and all the, the work that you guys have done. Darren, certainly you can see that the commissioners are so, uh, so very pleased with all the work that's been done on everybody's part. So um, I'm glad to hear everybody express those comments tonight because I think that we have come in very much so a very long way since the decision was made to come to the park and open the park. And I think that that there's, you know, there's still some things to do and there will be things to do. And the interim um, check-ins will be very useful and be able to focus on other things. I think, I'm not so sure how you put it, Jeff, but it was the priorities that weren't priorities or the left out priorities or something when you were talking earlier. So anyhow, let's move to the other commissioners uh, for comment as well. And I believe that Commissioner LaMare has arrived a little while ago and I didn't acknowledge that. So um, Jeff, welcome. Um, and since, since you're here, um, you were on the original ad hoc committee that made the recommendation to open the park. Do you have some comments or questions tonight? I appreciate everything that, that people are doing 
to make the opening a, a success. And I know that, uh, you know, certainly we need to be careful of the impact on the environment, but to see the number of people that are able to be exposed to the area is, is really fantastic. And um, as we just continue to, to, to monitor the use and, you know, to see where the different social trails are developing and how the impact on, on nature is, but um, such appreciation to so many people coming together to uh, try to make this a success. Um, I, I only actually just had one qu quick clarifying question. Um, what would be an example of an administrative citation that, that would be written and, and what, what would that be and, and why would it take the time that it does? Sure. So our most common admin, administrative citations are a remedy that we can, or not a remedy, but um, a form of citation that we can use in our toolboxes as employees of the city instead of issuing a citation as a notice to appear in a courtroom. Um, which would be common for an infraction or a misdemeanor to then go to court and argue it out. An administrative citation is handled within the city by um, our, our own legal staff. So essentially, it's a, a different pathway for um, dealing with the citation and the violation that keeps it within the city and a little uh, smaller kind of area for the infraction level. Um, it takes a long time to process, particularly parking violations, because of the requirements uh, for that report include things like the registered owner's information, which we have to run through dispatch. Um, and depending on how uh, impacted dispatch can be, we're not necessarily for a parking violation, a high priority for them to run information for. And that's to uh, process that citation so that it'll get to the right people. And that requires, unlike a normal parking citation, which can just be written out on the paper and then uh, issued, it requires a full report, which includes a full narrative of what I did as, or what any of the staff would do as a ranger, including you know coming on scene, describing the violation, saying what you did and doing a full uh, narrative report for the whole process. So it's it requires an amount of paperwork. And right now our, um, uh, right now, administrative, as far as parking goes, administrative citations are our only uh, citation that we can use. So it, it becomes a time consuming process for that. Thank you so much for that explanation. And thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Commissioner Brown, comments, questions? What a presentation and what a team. It's so impressive. And thanks to all your hard work. Um, I particularly like the analogy of the cup and filling the cup because when all these people that are visiting the park when their cups full they're going to want to give back and volunteer and be part of the uh, part of this amazing team. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the data. Thank you so much. I, I, the percentages of course can be overwhelming but there's obviously a learning curve and how to enjoy the preserve um, and I'll look forward to seeing uh, the story that data tells in future. So thank you to everybody. Thank you very much. Commissioner Rechtel. Yeah, again, I thank everyone for all their hard work. Uh, I knew we'd have a lot of challenges when we started and we've done far better than I ever expected. So I thank all the people who've been doing hard work. That includes staff and also the ad hoc. Um, Darren, you mentioned about the annual passes. Uh, the, for the non-residents, what cities are they coming from? Have you looked at that distribution? You know, I, I haven't got that. Uh, I can check to see if they can pull that, but I'm not quite sure. Because one of the concerns was they would just be coming from all the neighbors and basically we're, th this opening would benefit Los Altos Hills and not benefit EPA. It'd be interesting to see if they are spread over the area or whether they are just very close. You can look into that. Okay. Uh, one of my remaining concerns is finances. I mean, I hear that it takes three to five rangers to run the front gate. And when I look at all this, the fencing that we want to add, look at all the trails we want to add. Uh, I don't know how we're going to fund all that. And how are we doing overall? Does, does it, are we deep in the hole or are we going to be able to manage this in a timely manner? It's a complex question. I don't have the answers to, to everything. I can tell you, I have some resources come at the beginning of this next fiscal year to address some of those infrastructure improvements. For example, uh, the fencing. I believe I'll be able to handle that with existing uh, capital budget. Um, others are going to be more complicated. The parking, for example, um, could be more expensive. I probably need some analysis from a professional, uh, mean, meaning I have to hire a consultant. Um, 
some of the larger capital expenses haven't gone away, like the re replacement eventually of the three restrooms in the preserve. Those will have to be done eventually. I think we can limp along a little bit longer, but not much. Uh, the added cost of things like janitorial, we're dealing with that right now. So as Catherine pointed out, we've been limping along with support from other admin um, staff or CSD staff, for example, custodians at Coverly. While Coverly was closed due to COVID, they've been instrumental in helping out in other areas, in particular open space to clean restrooms. Now that they'll be pulling back to their regular jobs, we've got to find another way of meeting that. And we're juggling that right now. Um, it's about fifty dollars to $5,000 for the additional cleaning work. So we've got to either handle that with staff, um, volunteers, extra help from the Coverly staff helping out one day a week. We're kind of working through that right now. Are we neglecting Arostadero or Baylands by having the rangers come up for foothills? Yes. Yes, I, I think it's fair and accurate to say <clears throat> the extra demand and the focus on foothills has been to the detriment of attention that would otherwise have gone and spread out amongst the other preserves which will eventually lead to a backlog, both of maintenance and issues from lack of attention. Um, of course, we're cognizant of that. And we want to address that. So whenever we're capable, we're pulling staff away to help be at these other locations and do the work that needs to be done. I think one big uh, help will be restoration of the vacant uh, supervising ranger position. So that's in a budget proposal. Finance committee has not, um, deterred from that proposal of, of putting and restoring that position. So if everything goes according to the recommendation as it exists today, if council approves that, we would be able to fill that position, which will help immensely. We've had some turnover as we always do with our hourly staff. Um, but if we get those positions filled, and I'm really grateful um, that our department head and our review committee, we have an employee uh, review committee that looks at all vacant positions, even hourly ones, and scrutinizes whether we can fill them. And right now I've gotten approval to fill those vacant hourly positions, which is really huge in helping with that backlog of maintenance and other issues at the other preserves. So to answer your question, what's long-term fix for this? It's, it's greater reliance on volunteers where we can. Uh, other members of our department and other departments, see if we can get aid and assistance to meet our demands and making sure we're making sure we're taking care of at least the minimum patrol and maintenance of those other preserves. Especially Ross has seen a lot of people during COVID and I'm concerned that trail maintenance, that especially there's so many bikes on Ross I'm worried about them chewing up the trails and is there regular trail maintenance that you do at Ross because of the biking? Yeah, gratefully, that's not an area where we've had cutbacks. So we've got a contract with a trail maintenance contractor, and that was not reduced. And so the maintenance of the trails at Foothills and Pearson Rastero will continue. So we'll, I think we'll be on good ground in terms of trails. I, I also just want to highlight when we talk about visitation, it seems very high at Foothills and Pearson Rastero, and it is. But relative to the Baylands, probably have close to 600,000 visitors a year. Um, so heavy, heavy visitation there too. Oh, very good. Um, early on, we had reports of a lot of people biking on the trails in Foothills Park. Is that still getting reported or is that gone away? Yeah, maybe Catherine could speak to that better than I. Uh, reports continue. Um, we, it's, people on trails have uh, long been a common complaint that's called into the ranger office that we do respond to. Um, there's, there has been an increase, but it more in line with just with the number of people you would expect more of this kind of call. There isn't anything in particular about being overrun with bikes on trails, but it is something that we are, we respond to when we have the opportunity, but we don't have the opportunity right now on weekends in particular to get beyond the station or even really out of the truck to go walk those trails, which is the best way to encounter cyclists on trails is to actually be there and meet them because otherwise it's very difficult to find a good intersection and where to contact someone. But it does continue, um, but not remarkably higher than any other of our violation contacts than we track. At one time, we're, oh, one time we're talking about additional signage for uh, both the Coyote Trail and Panorama Trail. Uh, have we put signage up there? 
We did have additional signage. And I should also note one of the big outcomes we're hoping from the Trail Ambassador Program, we're investing time and energy, is that people can help with that messaging. On the Trail Ambassadors will be there to say, I'm sorry, bikes aren't allowed here. Here's where you are allowed to go, or here's another preserve. So we're hoping to address that in both with the signage that's already up and the Trails Ambassadors. And uh, every trailhead now does have a no bikes reminder sign that's been placed on it. So throughout the park and on the um, on all of our gates, there is a notification of that bikes are not permitted on trails. And are they big? Some of the no biking signs are kind of small. And if you're on a bike, it's really hard to see it. I think the majority of them are small. We do have our large signs at the entrance and at gate D and at the other uh, fire gates saying no entry. But I think most of the other trailheads are tend to be the smaller signs where we can fit them. Okay. Speaking of bikes, the public speaker mentioned about that gate D and back when we opened that uh, so to allow the people for the uh, Beta Ridge Trail to act, enter, the Beta Ridge Trail is just a pedestrian trail. So it makes sense at that time to not allow horses or allow uh, bikes through there. But now that, like as the public speaker mentioned, bikes are allowed on both sides of the gate. Why don't we let bikes through gate D? That was a decision council made, uh, Commissioner Rechtal, when we opened that trail. So it hasn't been re-examined since then, although the argument you'd often hear that I heard back in that time was that typically those are mountain bikes coming up from Pearson Rastadero and into Foothills, and that would encourage more bikes going into the trails at Foothills where they aren't allowed. Yeah. I would hope that people be able to follow rules because... Uh, yeah. There are people on mountain bikes in Foothills Park right now, and there are law-abiding bicyclists who can't go through that gate because they follow the rules, and so we're kind of penalizing the wrong people, I think. But, but anyway, the bottom line is this is something that council has to address. Yeah, the city, the uh, um, Foothills uh, ad hoc has that as an agenda item about a bike policy, uh, and it's very uh, difficult to keep bikes off of trails and uh, mountain bikes especially. So it is a, an attractive nuisance, let's put it that way, that gate. And so uh, you can put a many signs up there, but you have to make sure that they stay on the roads and uh, it's difficult. So stay tuned, we gotta, we have to deal with that. But for now, um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to deal with. Okay. And Keith, I think you've hit the nail on the head a, head a bit when you talk about following the rules and it would be great if people would follow the rules. And the unfortunate reality is we have a lot of issues with people not following the rules and, and it might, I don't know if it's a, a, a minority that's causing problems for the, for the, for the greater majority, uh, but, but bikes on the trails are, are an issue. And I, I I, I, under, I understand the perspective that letting mountain bikes in through that gate entrance is, is going to exacerbate our problems. And so I, I have concerns about changing that. Um, and, and one more question, Darren, are, are horses allowed in Foothills Park? No, we don't have trails. Uh, Pearson Rastadero Preserve is where we allow them. Okay, that's what I thought. So the issue of, there's no question of about opening the gate for horse equestrian entrance into Foothills Park where they're not allowed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a couple more questions here. Um, Catherine, uh, have we had any reports about smoking? Because you know, a lot of people go to parks and they smoke and Foothills Preserve appears to be a park and I'm worried that they're gonna use their park behavior and smoke there. In the first four months, I've had no record of a smoking contact between any of the four rangers that we have on. Oh, wow. great. That's great. It's very good. Um, and a couple questions about flora and fauna. Uh, <laughs> so Alex, you talked about invasive species. Uh, how invasive are the invasive species? Um, that's a difficult question to, to answer. I mean, it all depends on the species, like, um, but the reason why we target them, the ones that we are like Yellowstar thistle, Italian thistle, Detrichia, and also Medusa head, is that they're easily spread through a, both humans on trails as well as bikes. 
And then when they get in, they like they get into kind of disturbed areas and then they actively seed and are fire hazards and take up resources from other other plants. So that's why we are keeping an eye on them so that we can remove them because when they're small and you know initial populations are much easier to control. And so how much damage did the fact that we didn't have COVID, or the COVID prevented these people from coming in once a week and cleaning out the park? How damaged um, was that? Yeah, it was more as like last spring we were noticing this because we also steward a Rastrodera preserve and Medusa head is a plant that we've been trying to, you know, er eradicate. And so that it did definitely got a foothold last spring because we weren't able to come out with volunteers. But you know, we've been coming out this year um, with volunteers for the ever since June uh, of, of 2020 when we were allowed to come out. And Friends of Foothill have also been doing the same. And so um, I've heard, even though we have fewer numbers of people, the fact that the same volunteers are coming out on a repeated basis, and they're just more skilled. There, people are saying that on the ground impact is pretty much the same as it was in a pre-COVID year. Uh, so the, the final question I have is about the animals. Uh, you know, it's plants stay in one spot. And you can walk the trails and look for plants. Mm -hmm. uh, animals are all over. Is there any way, for example, there used to be a camera a, a trail counter up on Lost Tranquil's trail. Do we still have that trail counter that would count the people walking by the trail? I don't know. I've seen it. Uh, fairly recently. Okay. Would something like that or some type of wildlife camera? Well, that would... yeah, interestingly, we did, um, the Rangers helped us install a wildlife camera at our nursery, which is in the 7.7 .7 acre part of the site. And we started um, tracking that and we've seen foxes, we've seen a bobcat, and we even got a photo of a mountain lion right outside of the fence looking in. So yeah, there's they're still around. Um, but oh, we great. know that we don't have any scientific uh, monitoring for animals, like you know the traps and things like that. But at least what we're seeing on the um, wildlife cameras is pretty amazing. <laughs> That's great. Is there any way to to like once a week go in and walk through it and try and do a quick count if you reviewed it and played it at twenty times speed and <laughs> try and record what you saw and trying to use that as a trending tool to to see how wildlife is being affected. Yeah, we, we've we been, um, we've worked with some universities like San Jose State at Arastrodero helped us do this. Actually, it's quite time consuming. And so right now the scope and our budget doesn't allow our staff time to do that. But we've worked with um, students and volunteers to do some of that. And so um, that's also been an idea that we've been having with, um, we have another partnership with Stanford students coming up this fall. So that's one idea. Um, and uh, there's also some crowdsourcing techniques that I know people are, are looking into. But right now it's anecdotal. We, I mean, we do go through it and it's a way on the wildlife camera that you can see, you know, when it captures something, you can see those images. Yeah, I would love, you know, Stanford yeah. has a very good AI department and I would right. love to take Kate, your wildlife feed and have them take a look at it and automate the process of mm -hmm. scanning through and telling you what, what was on the camera. Right. Would that you collect camera data? Yeah, we we usually when we talk with Stanford students, we'll have like a list of projects that we'd like love to have help on, and that's always been one of them. So so far, they haven't taken us up on that one, <laughs> but um, we can uh, continue to 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 promote that one. But um, the yeah, but, but, but you would be able to capture if if you there was someone that wanted to automate this, you'd be able to capture that and deliver days of data on your wildlife camera. I think so. Uh, honestly, I'll have to look into that. I don't, I don't, not that familiar with it. Okay. You know where the data sits, but somebody, somehow I know our staff is finding mountain lions. So maybe Catherine might know better since the Rangers, the ones that help us install it. Alex, uh, Jasper Ridge has been doing camera trapping for years and you have Jerry Hearn on your staff um, and he's an expert at that. So uh, by all means, use those camera traps buy, uh, we should get someone to donate some more yeah. and uh, and use that. And they do have the AR, AI software already for Santa Cruz Mountains uh, animals. So take full advantage of that. And I'm so glad that they're on the, uh, 
uh, stewardship uh, uh, committee. Yeah, Keith, I'm glad you brought that up because um, we can put that on the list of our people stakeholder group and uh, look forward look forward to that and even talk about um, contributions in the future and relationships with AI. So that that was that was good, Keith. Thank you. Okay, just just one additional comment on that, Commissioner Rectal. Um, what we've used in the past to try to meet this endeavor, at least the other preserves, I think we've done it once or twice, but not often enough, is bio blitzes. CIS and bio blitzes. And if you do them with a frequency quarterly, perhaps we might be able to come closer to achieving something what we're talking about here. And that, of course, would be all volunteer led. The processing of that is all done by volunteers. So that might be an option. And again, I think it's a good one to bring up with our people group. Yep. Okay. And I know that Santa, uh, Santa Clara Audubon Society often yeah. does uh, bird um, census. Um, like Christmas bird count and things like that. So they could be a resource as well. Okay, thank you, that's all. I, thanks again, all the work that you've done. I uh, especially appreciate the, the volunteers who are doing this out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, staff, Darren gets a paycheck every week. He's worth it, but uh, the other people are, we've had so much volunteers going on up there. It's been very helpful. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for all your questions. Um, Darren, if I may, I just have a few really specific questions um, before we wrap this up. Um, the Both the annual passes and the video, um, what are some of the plans for promoting those, the annual passes and also the video into the broader community? I think Elliot might be able to speak to this <clears throat> better than I can, but the plan is to connect with our chief communications officer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she's fantastic at getting the word out. And I think Elliot's very skilled himself. Between the two of that and all our other partners, we'll get it out on social media, websites, and all the other things that, again, our chief communication officer recommends. As Catherine pointed out, publicizing and getting people excited about the annual pass option during summer sounds like a wonderful idea to me. And we'll be pitching that as well. Probably look for that on the communications um, push out that Megan uh, Taylor does. So should be seeing that. Good, and, and I really appreciate the data about um, the resident annual pass numbers and the non-resident annual pass numbers. I thought that was, that was all that data was really, really good. Um, then one of two of my other interests are outreach to East Palo Alto um, and the underserved communities. And if we're, uh, if we're able to reach them yet, um, I don't know how we know that, but uh, just wondering about that. And the last thing is camps at Foothill Park this summer. Um, are we having them or not this year? Yes, I believe we are. And um, I don't know if John's still on on with us, but I believe JMZ has some programs up planned for Foothills this summer. I heard from Alex Hamilton. Is that is that correct, John? Saying yes, it is. I just couldn't get to my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I think we can plan. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, that's good. Are the Girl Scouts coming back? Don't know that yet. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, just to wrap this up and move on to the next agenda item, I wanna say thank you again um, to everybody who's participated in this and you know, great job and we'll look forward to the future. So um, thank you. So then that would lead us to the next agenda item, which is the um, sidewalk vendors in the park policy. Thanks for the staff report on that. And I'll give this back to you, Darren, for um, Comments. Thanks, Chair. Just one second. Okay. Uh, I'm here tonight to ask for your feedback, commissioners, on regulations relating to sidewalk vendors operating in Palo Alto's open space and parks. Staff recommends that the commission consider creating an ad hoc committee for this issue, which is the next item on the agenda. Uh, in 2018, the state of California approved SB 946, which requires cities and counties to permit sidewalk vendors to operate within their jurisdictions. 
And SB 946 requires that sidewalk vendors be able to operate in, in city parks. However, the city can regulate the time, place, and manner of the sidewalk vendors in one or more of the following conditions are met. So these are key. And I'm just going to go over them real quickly because for every regulation that we want to pass related to this, we have to be able to tie it to at least one of these. <clears throat> so it has to be directly related to the objective of health, safety, or welfare concerns necessary to ensure the public's use and enjoyment of natural resources and recreational opportunities, and necessary to prevent the undue concentration of commercial activity that unreasonably interferes with the scenic or natural character of the park. I should note, I had the city attorney's office review the draft list, which are just suggestions. Um, we might come up with more, but the attorney looked at that draft list and felt that every single one of those met one or more of these criteria for what it's worth. The police department's currently drafting a replacement ordinance to be compliant with SB 946. And as part of that process, staff are seeking input from the both park staff and the Parks and Recreation Commission related to the rules for how these sidewalk vendors would operate in parks. Staff created a long list of potential new regulations for the sidewalk vending in open space and parks. And the focus of the, the draft regulations are to ensure sanitary, safe, clean conditions to protect wildlife and habitat and to continue to provide positive visitor experience. <clears throat> Staff also recommend creating maps of limited areas in Palo Alto's open space preserves where vendors are allowed to operate. And the, the thinking behind this is that you saw the draft list in staff report of all the different rules. And it becomes so onerous, I thought, especially in a really large area, 2000 acre nature preserve to figure out where you can and cannot go that I, I had suggested that an attorney said it would be okay to have a map for each of those areas to say, it's not where you can't go, here's where you may go. And that seemed like a, a starting place for at least for a conversation for this group to consider. It would also be a lot easier for the staff who eventually have to enforce these regulations. What we were trying to achieve with these draft regulations was to ensure that vendors could safely operate without blocking trails, parking spaces, damaging landscape vegetation, disrupting recreation for park visitors or harming wildlife uh, and the ecology or impacting views, damaging park infrastructure. Um, or encouraging food in places where it might be problematic, food stains on playgrounds, for example, or encouraging pests that pursue food waste. Um, those are problems that we have currently, and I certainly wouldn't want to exacerbate them. So I've got an, five, or excuse me, three slides of these um, different regulations for you to consider. And of course, these were listed in the staff report, so I won't repeat them now, but we can refer to these three slides if you've got any specific questions or you'd like to see them again. But I've got uh, three slides and they're fairly exhaustive in all the different criteria that they cover, uh, ranging from things like you've got to comply with health, um, county health department rules and distances from park amenities and things like that when you can operate, you must close up 30 minutes prior to the park closing, all those different details. Um, and we certainly suggest that we form an ad hoc where staff can sit down and go through these and see what else we're missing, get some good feedback. And of course, uh, from tonight as well. Regarding those maps I mentioned, as we looked through our open space preserves, um, for places that would be appropriate, it was hard to find spots that wouldn't be blocking road parking or trails. Um, this one particular spot at the Baylands um, is a little open area. It's compacted base rock. Uh, park cars do not park in there, but there's still good travel. Um, and I thought if someone had to vend, this might be an appropriate place to consider. Likewise, at the Baylands Athletic Center, if they're not going to block a pathway or be in the road or in a parking spot, there wasn't a lot. This is a paved little area at the athletic center, but you will note in the draft regulations that I included that it says if there was a concessionaire operating, like at the golf course, this would preclude someone from coming and bending. And there is a snack shack here at the Baylands Athletic Center. So we could add a rule that says it's not appropriate to vend when snack shacks open or something to that extent. Uh, but that was our, our efforts to put together maps. We'd obviously have to create more. I did ask the attorney's office if they thought we could preclude a particular place altogether. And he didn't think that was likely. 
Um, however, as I looked at, for example, Esther Clark Park, there's only one trail that goes through that preserve. It's a dirt trail. Typically, when I looked at other agencies' rules around vending, they don't allow them on dirt trails. Then there would literally be no other spot within that preserve for them to operate. And perhaps it could just be one of the adjacent street side parking if they wanted to be there. There's also a little bit of thinking about would anyone ever want to vend at a place like Esther Clark Park where you just have sporadic visitation, um, probably unlikely, but it doesn't stop us from having to go through this exercise and defining the rules around where vending could be. And um, lastly, the, the next steps in our process, um, June or July, 2021, to have the PRC provide a recommendation on a regulation for the vendors. And then in August or September of 2021, it's the anticipated date that council discussion and potential adoption of a new ordinance would take place. When I asked the attorney's office which way they thought these would go in terms of regulations specific to parks and open space, would it be wrapped into an ordinance or would they be standalone regulations? Uh, it wasn't quite determined yet. So I think we'll get more direction on that soon. My hunch is they'll probably be standalone regulations, but we shall see. And Chair, that wraps up uh, staff presentation. Okay, um, shall we see if there are any speakers um, from the audience who would like to speak on this topic? Lam? Chair, at present, there are no uh, requests for uh, public speaking. Great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. And then um, questions from the commission. Um, let's just start with uh, Commissioner uh, Brown. And um, do we know if we've gotten complaints about um, sidewalk vendors um, or what the major complaints have been uh, in the past? Yes, uh, we have gotten complaints the one I hear most frequently is at the Magical Bridge Playground. Um, it makes sense because we have 25,000 visitors a month to that playground more than any other spot in our, our park system. And so obviously there's a lot of customers there. And the problems are it causes a lot of waste and mess on the, the playground equipment. Um. This may be a dumb question, but so if, if this was required back in 2018, what was the delay and in, in, it's just its capacity to, to look at this? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I came to my attention about a month and a half ago. Um, I just didn't end up hearing about it. And maybe it was something the police department had been kind of taking their time with. I'm not quite sure, but the attorney's office reached out a month and a half ago to me. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rechtel? Sorry, it's muted. Uh, yeah, I'm torn about this because in some situations, sidewalk vendors can actually add the ambiance and, and make it more of a community uh, feel in a park. But I can see that if, if the kids are now getting popsicles and they're getting the swings or whatever, or the magical bridge dirty or littering, then I can see this being a, a, a really a pain. So I have... I don't know how liberal we want to be in allowing uh, vendors. Um, one of my concerns is the size of the vending. If it's too large, even if it's not blocking the whole path, like I'm thinking Mitchell Park, uh, if it's taking up a big chunk of that path, now as people have to pass around it, you're basically are, mm -hmm. um, you're blocking one of the lanes of traffic. So that, that concerns me. Uh, you mentioned, Darren, that if, if we have a vendor there in, in the park, we can then prohibit it. Uh, what kind of uh, radius is that? So for example, uh, the, at uh, the community center, Mitchell Park Community Center, if that cafe is open, does that apply to the park? I don't believe so. Um, I think that would, at Mitchell, we would still have to find locations where that would be appropriate. And I think largely those rules would be in place. Maybe we can add something specific to Mitchell if you think that's necessary. The, the one that stood out most to us in terms of, of this issue was the golf course mm -hmm. where we've got a full 
time open restaurant. And that would cover the entire golf course. Um, but the street up to it would be open for vendors, meaning the sidewalk along Embarcadero Road is a place where vendors could, in theory, still operate. Um, I, I don't know if that would hold exactly true to the Mitchell Park. We can look more into it. But again, my hunch is from my initial conversations with the attorney that at Mitchell Park, they would still be allowed to operate. But they can't block the path. Yeah, correct. And you saw in the draft language that could go to it. I think I added in a certain width of pathway. Uh, I think it's on this one. Trails less than eight feet wide. Yeah. Um, that was my best guess. I was trying to think, as you rightly noted, there are different size vendors um, that have different size carts. And depending on the crowd you've gathered, it could draw more people in and you could still take over even a wide trail like Mitchell, depending on how popular your cart is. Um, I just wanted to give us, I, I guess it's that balance you said, we've got to be fair. This is intended to be um, something that allows vendors to operate. So we don't want to be overly restrictive according to the attorney's office. At the same time, we want to protect those assets. So on a, nail, a narrow trail, for example, and I'm sure you've seen this before, whether it was a vending cart or something else, as soon as there's an obstacle, people will go on the grass or if it's landscaping, they'll go through that and it gets trampled. And it doesn't take a lot of those before it'll wear out an area, kill off the plants or kill off the grass. Um, and I just want to do our best to avoid that. We've also just two other examples of problems that have come from food related things. Um, in our playgrounds in the last five or six years, um, and I'm not exactly sure quite why, but we've had an increasing number of incidences where ground squirrels will take food out of people's hands, out of their backpacks. They're far more aggressive than they once had been um to the point of really being a problem so we posted no feet no obviously no feeding because there's no feeding of wildlife rules pre-existing but to not have food in playgrounds was one of the things we've been working on i'd love to retain the ground we've gained on that by stopping that problem and not exacerbating it um and then the other issue is just if you look at a place like Lytton plaza where we had a problem where people were cooking out there they were bringing stoves and cooking food and the stains from grease got onto the surfacing and they were impossible to get out. We pressure wash, we did all sorts of things. It was very, very difficult. Just something I wanna be cognizant of and just protect our resources from any accidental incidents like that where a vendor comes out and, and spreads grease onto a pathway or a park amenity. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is gonna be challenging. Yeah. It is. There are lots of lots of examples, lots of things, what to do. Um, are you finished with questions, yeah, Keith? I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Moss. Yeah, I <clears throat> I'm really, really sorry about this regulation. Um, <laughs> I I'm not ambiguous uh, like uh, Commissioner Rechdahl. Um, I think that there should be a monumental cost put on every uh, piece of food that is sold by a vendor to pay for trash cleanup and uh, environmental mitigation. Uh, I, I dread the open space preserve because you get an ice cream vendor right near the front gate uh, selling ice cream, but you know that that ice cream and the paper that, that surrounds it is going to be on the trails um, way into the park. And you get somebody going to Baranda Lake and you're gonna get a lot of trash in the, in the water. There is a cost to that that city council is going to have to pay for to keep that clean and to uh, not have it spoil the environment. Uh, and of course, the ground squirrel issue is going to be even worse in the open spaces. So putting a two or three dollar uh, per ice cream cone uh, surcharge uh, on each purchase, um, I don't think that there's going to be very many vendors who are going to want to eat that cost. So um, we have to consider the cost. 
the environmental cost and the, the cleanup uh, that's going to be necessary to deal with the vendors, much as we'd like them to be around. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Olson. Um, just a few questions. Is there any sort of permit or permit fee that we're contemplating yet, Darren? I believe so. It'll be Powell to Police that handle that. And I think there's a modest fee associated, but I believe that's still under discussion. Okay. And then this would not include something like a food truck, right? Because it's just limited to sidewalks? I believe that's correct. This is distinct from food trucks. Okay. And then um, I noticed that we had sort of the trails and grass areas and vegetated here. I'm not seeing anything that's sort of protecting waterways other than um, the baylands. Is there, I'm wondering whether we could add in sort of waterways as well. Good, good idea. Um, and as somebody that lives right next to Esther Clark Park and right, walks through it every day. It would be pretty funny to see a sidewalk vendor there. So, <laughs> you know, I think just the uh, the commercial potential will probably drive some of this, you know, where we have the higher density parks and whatnot is probably more likely where we'll see it. And those are the areas I think we're gonna see a lot of the trash and waste that we need to really think about um, whether we have designated areas with extra trash cans around there. And yeah, it's gonna be a challenge. So, and I vote for Commissioner Moss to be on the commission <laughs> on the ad hoc for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all my questions, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Commissioner LaMere. Yeah, I just had a question similar to Jackie in terms of food trucks, but uh, further, what if we know how are food trucks permitted or are they permitted in parks at times? I believe it's restaurants? only by permit. So typically when there's a special event, that'll be part of the permit request. And mm -hmm. it goes through uh, a multi-department review, including the fire department to make sure that they're uh, insured and following health orders and that kind of thing. Okay. So there's, there's currently s some sort of protocol for, I guess, for the food service and so forth. Uh, in parks. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Anything else, Jeff? Um, all of my other comments and questions were co covered by the other commissioners. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the comprehensive report and first pass uh, set of rules that Darren and staff have worked on it. It's, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. I'm glad that the Parks and Rec Commission is being engaged on this. Uh, just kind of a, a fundamental, taking a step backwards question, and I, it's, prob it's probably a quick answer, but I need to ask, does SB 946 distinguish between parks and open space areas uh, with, with respect to permitting vending? Are, are we actually required to permit vending uh, in the open space areas? Does, does MidPen have to have the same requirement to uh, permit vending in their open space areas. I can't speak to MidPen, but I did specifically ask that question of our attorney. And he said, yes, we would still, we'd have to have an awful good rationale for excluding them all together. The example I gave of Esther Clark is one where it was hard to imagine a place that's appropriate, but he said, we really need to be finding some options. You saw the two that I came up with Baylands those are two very, very small areas um, for a 2000 acre preserve. Um, and so if we don't feel that it's appropriate in most of open space, we can find very small areas where we think we could allow it. I, I didn't include it in the map that uh, I shared on this uh, presentation, but we've got some for Pearson Rasadero. Again, it's really only one small area that would be even feasible. It's in the parking lot. Um, I can't imagine someone would want to vend there, but it's the only spot that I thought made sense that would be safe for the vendor and for the, the public. Uh, thank you. So perhaps contrary to my typical approach on things, um, rather than getting into the details this evening, I would be in favor of forming an ad hoc to, to pour over the, the policies you're working on and, and craft a, rec 
help craft recommendation to the commission and try to work more efficiently on it in that manner. Yeah, I, I think I think that's uh, that's the next issue or the next step on the agenda. So I think that's what we'll be moving to. I just wanted to get all the commissioner's questions um, answered, and I have just two of my own. Darren, it's not possible to separate parks and open space. That's what I'm hearing, so that we wouldn't have to allow um, vending in open space, right? That's correct. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to be able to deal with the two separately. And then um, you answered the question about food trucks and how they're handled. Um, in the areas that you're designating, for instance, for vendors, can they move around in that area? Um, is, uh, is it like a push cart that I can take my ice cream cart and go from one place to another? Like what's happening now at, very often at Mitchell Park or do they have to stay in a specific place that we designate? Yeah, that's a great question. Even as I was putting this map together, I was thinking, well, it's not like they're going to drop by helicopter down to the spot, right? They're mm -hmm. potentially parking outside the preserve and pushing the cart all the way in. So I assume they're all along the edge of the road, stopping as customers come. It'd be very difficult to enforce. I think this is one of those situations where we do the best we can with providing simple guidance that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, even, even in light of the challenge of actually enforcing this, I think it's really valuable to have something simple that we can say to someone, say we're at the Baylands and the ranger is selling at the duck pond where we don't want them to be because it's taking up parking or causing a problem. Having some simple map for the ranger to hand to this person to say, here's where you can go. Unfortunately, you can't vent here, I think would be valuable. Okay, well, I, I think those are my only questions because the rest of the commissioners brought up all of the other good good questions as well. So let's move on to, we don't need any- I, I have one follow-up. Okay. David brought up the point of taxes. Could we put a surcharge? I assume regular sales tax applies here, but would we have the ability to put a surcharge on that? I'd be glad to check with the attorney. My, my hunch is not, mm -hmm. I think, I think if, for example, there's a heavy concern about trash, you'll probably have noted that I had an item that says they've got to provide their own trash and they've got to take it out. Mm -hmm. And we can make that more robust if that's what we're really trying to achieve. But I don't believe that we would be able to add that. But again, I'm, I'm glad to check with the attorney's office. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be good. That on, a, on a that same topic, because there would be a food service establishment, they would be subject to the disposable food service for ordinance in the city, correct? Yes. Yeah, an added challenge um, was the three sort system. So this is another issue is yeah. they should be providing all three services, meaning trash, recycling, and composting. And I'm trying, I tried to envision how this would work. And one of my staff said, well, they could just have three different colored bags that they carry with them. Um, one for each of those, just like we have to provide at parks for our trash and recycling closures. So something like that, it's an added challenge for them, but um, one that's probably the more responsible as we want to take care of our preserves and parks. It's an opportunity to be more forward thinking and trend setting. Yeah, um, the regulation says that the cities can tell you when, where, and how often. Um, and I'm thinking that you could provide for special events like um, mo movie night and, and music in the park, in Mitchell Park, and not have to provide it every minute of every day in every park. And I would like the city um, uh, attorney to, uh, to explain that in more detail. Uh, I, and I also, and use that to keep them out of say the open spaces, except maybe on a special, uh, special event like Monday morning from eight to 10. <laughs> what I really meant is like 10 a.m. on a Saturday, but yeah. For, for two hours, something like that. And, uh, and try to limit, I wanna know how many, how much limit we can have on all three of those things that I mentioned. Um, that's really, really important. Okay, well, those are all good comments again, and I think it can move us into the, <clears throat> 
seeking uh, members for an ad hoc on the uh, sidewalk vendor policy. So do I hear any people who would like to uh, join that ad hoc? Good, that's excellent. Anybody else? Thank you, David. Okay. Was that the commission? I, said, I, I would like to join. Great. I, my, and I'll join, I'll join as well. My computer um, split out and I, I just heard a noise, but I didn't hear it was. So that's great, Mandy. Thank you very much. And Keith, was that you? It was Jeff. It was Jeff. Okay, good. So there's the ad hoc, Darren. Um, do we need to have a motion to do that? Sorry, sorry un un unless somebody else is interested in the seat. I'm just interested in filling that ad hoc. So I think it's great. And uh, we could have a motion then from somebody. I move that we create an ad hoc with commissioners Greenfield, Brown and Moss. Thank you. And a second. I'll second. Thank you. And Catherine, would you take a vote, please? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner LaMare? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Seven to approve the ad hoc. That's great. Well, I'd like to thank all the commissioners who volunteered to be on this ad hoc. Uh, I suspect it will be um, a very interesting uh, series of meetings and recommendations. So thank you for doing that. Okay, let's move on now to the Baylands Nature Preserve Interpretive Sign Project and um, John Aiken. And I know we've been looking forward to hearing about this. So um, Darren, I'll turn it over to you to introduce John. Thank you, Chair, and a big thanks to John for waiting so patiently um, towards the end of this long meeting. Really appreciate you having having you here and, and sharing the information on this project. I know we're excited about it. John Aikens, the director of the Junior Museum and Zoo, um, an outstanding uh, colleague. Thanks so much for being here, John. We can't hear you. One second, got it. Catherine, is there anything you can do to help John unmute? Maybe this becomes one big game of charades. <laughs> That's right. I was just going to say, <laughs> John, if it does, all I can all I can do is ask him to unmute. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> I, I think I just did it, but to do that, I had to close my presentation and. Oh. Um, but let me see if I can get to screen sharing. That's the part that I'm not able to get to, it seems, because uh, I can't get back to Zoom. It won't open for me. Let me, uh... sorry, you guys. Mm. It's the world of Zoom. <laughs> yeah, and PDFs, the first of the PDF crashed. And then uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what other program might be driving this thing. So I'm just I'm slowly closing the model, sorry. All right, um, are we getting there? Uh, we are getting close, please. There we are. I found a, uh, I found a um, message for me to close something. Nope, still can't open Zoom. Ah! <laughs> Don't know what to do here. Let's see. Try pushing that down. Let's see if this come now. No. Closing everything. Ah, uh, man, I'm sorry. Uh, is there another agenda item? And I will, and you can circle back with me. I will uh, try and reboot and come back. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask Darren if John could email the presentation to you or Lom and you could put it up. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, is that something you could do, John? Is that helpful? The other one is, to your point, if you want to log off Zoom, sometimes that tends to cure things and, and try rejoining might be a, a way. Great. Uh, I'm going to copy both of you. Wow. Yeah, things are really going slow on my computer. Something's not happy. <clears throat> Great. 
Great, it's sent. Oh, nice. that was a great idea. All right, I'm going to, uh, I, should I actually close it or should I just close the window? Well, um, if you're able to, if this email comes through, that I don't think you need to do anything else. You just tell me when to change screens as soon as I've, I, I don't have it yet. Great. But, Lom, do you have anything yet? It, uh, it actually may be a big file. <laughs> I didn't even look at the file size. No, it has not arrived to, to me either yet. And it hasn't come back to me yet. So Darren, maybe we leave John to shut down his computer and then come back again, which usually seems to help. And we can move on just to the short item about the letter to the council regarding the junior museum fees. Would that be okay with everybody? Is that okay, John? Yes, I'll be right back. Oh, thanks so much. Okay, great. So um, number seven on the agenda is a letter that um, I would like to have the commission um, say okay to that we would like to send to the council um, regarding the reduction, our support for the reduction of the $18 entry fee to $10 um, in our current fiscal situation with a um, encouragement to uh, review um, the entry fees uh, with the thought of maybe reducing them further um, as our, our um, economic climate improves. And it's just a, a simple letter that um, Darren helped me with. And I just thought it would be a good thing for the commission to, to support the recommendation of the finance committee um, and make sure that um, people understand that we would like it to be less money, we understand the, the economic climate that we're in. So everybody got a copy of that. Um, of that letter and uh, we can have a discussion. Um, I don't think there's anybody who wants to speak from the public. I don't see any hands. Um, so commissioners, any comments? Um, would you be in favor of sending this on? It's an action item. I, I'd, I'd like to just start by uh, observing that what we're recommending is is consistent with what the finance committee has already recommended. And, and so this is a, I view this as a pretty simple statement uh, recommending, uh, su supporting the, the direction that a, a, a council committee is already moving in. I think it's appropriate and reasonable given the, the public outcry about this, uh, the, uh, the, the amount, amount of, uh, focus and attention this issue's got, gotten for us to make a, a simple statement. And I think this is just a, a simple statement and that's the intention of it. I would recommend that in the first sentence, we add an S after park to uh, correct our the proper name of our commission. So it oh, says- My only comment is that I think that when uh, um, Kristen, uh, Kristen, um, uh, talked about this uh, last meeting. She said this would the ten dollar fee would cover sixty percent of operating costs, and uh, whereas eighteen would cover a uh, hundred percent. So, um, what will city council say, or what will how will uh, staff deal with that um, budget shortfall? Will they reduce hours? Will they reduce the number of people uh, of staff at JMZ? So I, I think that calculus was based on the assumption that the same number of people would attend or would there be the same number of paid entries to the JMZ regardless of the price point. And I think there's a important consideration that if the price point is at $18, then we'll have quite a few uh, fewer people uh, visiting the facility and, and it's possible and we, and we don't really know exactly what the uh, the, the, crop, the cost trade-off is between reducing from 18 to ten dollars per, per person yeah make no no mistake I think that the eighteen dollar fee is way way over 
way over and ten dollars is much more uh, realistic. Um, so I just really um, we'll have to see how the costs uh, are covered and how how much cost we really incur um, by having more people paying less. Any other comments from other commissioners? Okay, if not, is there a motion to um, send this letter forward or to approve it? I move to support the letter. Thank you, in a second. I'll second it. Thank you, Jeff. And um, Catherine, would you do a vote again, please? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner LaMare? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Rechtal? Yes. Seven to approve sending your letter. Thank you very much. How are we doing, John? Let's give it a try. Shall I try right. there? <laughs> um, let's go. Here we go. All right. Can everybody see it? Yes. And the, there we go in full screen and. And, and here we go. Thank you all for inviting me today. Um, we This project, gosh, got started in 2016, I think. It's, a, it's been a, a very long but near and dear project. Um, and it's got a, a new name. We've been calling it Friendship Trail. Um, the interpretive vision for this uh, series of signs uh, was to bridge two communities that are caring for our salt marsh, East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. It was conceptualized when we used the East Palo Alto facility uh, while we were renovating the, the nature center and um, realized how, too close, how close they were and wouldn't it be great to challenge people to, to move between these facilities. Uh, it uh, has some very, I guess, specific sort of um, uh, ideas around how those signs will shape the visitor's experience. One, it'll have focused content. Uh, it will focus on things that you can see, smell, um, or feel at the site. Uh, You'll also learn about people protecting and preserving the marsh as examples. Um, and the labels are in Spanish and English. It connects facilities in East Palo Alto and Palo Alto. So for instance, you can start at the Cooley Landing Education Center in East Palo Alto, come to the Lucy Evans Nature Center, go all the way down to the sailing station uh, launch, um, and then end up at the Environmental Volunteers Eco Center which is, by the way, got the most beautiful photographs in this presentation. <laughs> uh, here's an example of an interpretive sign on the deck of the Lucy Evans Nature Center. That program uh, provided an opportunity for us to create a master plan for this. And so the idea is that all of these are going to have this similar sort of look and feel and language. They're, they do vary a little bit because trail signs are a little bit bigger than the ones on the boardwalk. There are limited interactive exhibits, um, limited both because they're expensive um, and limited because there are places where we know they will get trashed very, very quickly. And so we're trying to put them in safe places in places where we can manage them. And we're building them to be bulletproof, really strong. The budget uh, is, I'm gonna move, you guys are blocking my roll up numbers, or $233,000 um, in, and that, is for the revenue that had come in from grants, uh, both local grants and a state grant. I've, I've got to thank the friends of the Palo Alto Parks and the environmental volunteers for all of their support in, in, in particular. Uh, the, uh, and it matches our expense. Um, uh, we pulled the design out of the grant request for the state parks to increase our, op our opportunity to receive the $162,000, which is for fabrication and ins installation. Here are our partners. Uh, pretty much all of the people that are all working hard to try and protect the, the Baylands. Um, and uh, it's been great working with these folks. Um, we've uh, been working with San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority for a while now, and we are collaborating on their exhibits on Friendship Bridge and making sure that these systems uh, uh, collaborate, that the public has a, a 
a visitor experience that's, that's seamless. Uh, the last time we met uh, was in June 2017, and since then, uh, the Planning and Architectural Review Board has uh, approved uh, the project. So we've got a, a building permit or a, a planning permit to put them in. We received input from public uh, stakeholders and partners um, and came up with the idea of a working title for this trail system called Friendship Trail because it goes across Friendship Bridge and it's about bridging these two communities. Uh, we obtained grant funds for the soft costs um, and uh, actually engineering costs and developed the design and surveyed uh, for the deed restrictions that are required by the state. Just very quickly, the state of California requires that we put a deed restriction on land that we own so that that land is, uh, stays in the purpose that these signs have intended uh, for 30 years. And what that means is the park will remain a park the open space will remain an open space, that it doesn't really change the use. We aren't gonna sell it and, and, and make money and, and that sort of stuff. And so that's why they, re they require it to protect their capital investment. Uh, the original ideas for interpretive messages uh, was, well, gosh, kind of a Burma shave long line of, of signs all the way along uh, the bay. Um, but I think everybody was sort of appalled that that, that many signs uh, seemed kind of crazy. and. So we've found ways of sort of clustering them into interpretive nodes that have anywhere between one and four signs at each node. And they um, then have an opportunity to sort of talk about the neighborhood, um, which we do a fair amount, particularly in East Palo Alto, because in meeting with these Palo Alto residents and, um, and the city managers, they, uh, they, there's a great source of pride in the history of these, these neighborhoods. And so they, they thought that, uh, uh, the, the residents would really enjoy it if we could uh, focus uh, some of our interpretive messages there. And then the interpretive nodes on the boardwalk, uh, the boardwalk was built uh, for these five interpretive nodes. Uh, there are special railings that hold the signs and uh, we're gonna cluster some of the interpretive elements, uh, interactive elements in, in those locations as well. Uh, We've got a, a off the shelf standard for attaching signs on the trails. Um, I, I just explained the one for the boardwalk, which we built into the boardwalk. Here, these um, are similar to the standards that are holding up uh, the signs in uh, Rinconada Park. And Darren can probably tell me where the other parks they're, they're in, but they're, they're off the shelf. But we, some of them are gonna have uh, just a concrete footing and other ones may have pads. We're working with the rangers right now to determine where we need to put pads. It's off, it's more expensive to do that. Um, and as much as we thought it was going to improve accessibility for people in wheelchairs, it actually doesn't in many cases. After years, the ground squirrels get under these pads and undermine the surface around them and you and really restrict access to the tops of pads. Elevations of soils change. Um, so it may be better to actually use the, um, the uh, just the footings in, in many places and use DG, decomposed granite underneath them. Uh, there, the timeline here is broken into two pieces. There's kind of the history when we uh, really, it started getting serious with this project, even though it was conceptualized in, in 2016. Um, what we have yet to do is to complete the design and the deed restrictions. Where, what I mean by that is we actually have all of the text written. It's being translated into Spanish right now. Those then need to be inputted in for every sign, laid out, kerned, photographs added. Um, if there's an interactive element on the sign, like a bronze thing, uh, that it gets cast and ready to go in uh, so that it's ready to be assembled for the uh, fabri during fabrication and um, and then installed. We need to bid the fabrication contract because it's a it's a, a high contract. It has to go to city approval. So we will bring the deed. Uh, the plan is to bring the deed restrictions and the fabrication contract to uh, city council at the same time uh, later this fall. And then uh, we have an installation window out in the Baylands on the uh, uh, next to the marsh because of threatened and endangered species breeding. Um, periods uh, and chick rearing periods in the spring and summer. And so really it's winter time when we have the opportunity to go out there and install. Not the best time to drive around on levees. So um, we're working out all that constructability issues, but uh, we are gonna try and do the installation kind of really dead winter. Um, trying to finish everything up uh, March of 22. And that's it. 
Um, but I'd love to take your questions. Uh, there's a lot going on there and I'm uh, happy to answer questions now or, or at any time. John, that was great. Thank you so very much. Um, I appreciate knowing all of that. We've been waiting to hear about it. So thank you. Um, any members of the public wanting to speak on this, Lam? I don't have my screen back, so I can't see any hands. Chair, there are no requests uh, from public speakers at this time. Thank you very much. Um, questions, comments from the commissioners? Let's start with uh, Jeff Lemaire. Uh, John, thank you so much for this presentation and all the work that you've put into this. Uh, I, I will say I do miss former chair McDougal, who would always have uh, wonderful questions about uh, signage. Um, with this uh, with this project, I, I do appreciate us uh, reaching across and, and having things in, in two languages and a partnership uh, with different people and, and different uh, with our neighbors. And so Thank you so much for all of your, your time with this and appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Commissioner Olson. Um, I also wanna give thanks, John. This was a great presentation. Um, I really like that it the signage is being based off of the Lucy Evans Interpretive Center signage because it's just, such engaging content on such a small area of, of space. And uh, you know, I know it'll be great. I like the clusters as well, as opposed to like the continuous sign. So I'm looking forward to, um, you know, seeing how this uh, manifests itself. And it's been a very long project for you. So thank you for your dedication on it. Thank you, Jackie. Commissioner Moss. Um, I have been um, <clears throat> interested in this project since the beginning, and I've been to several of the uh, meetings out there at the uh, Baylands, and I'm so happy to see it coming to fruition as quickly as it does, as it did. And when we were talking, we did have many, many, many stations, uh, and to see it now clustered into uh, a, man, a more manageable uh, set of nodes is uh, very encouraging. It reduces the cost and, um, and the uh, clutter, I don't know. Um, so I think that that was a, a big um, improvement. Uh, and I also know that uh, the, si the signage, the, the messages that we have to present are really important. And so uh, I'm so excited to see this uh, coming, uh, coming to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Commissioner Rectal. Yeah, good work, John. Uh, I'm also excited about this. Uh, you mentioned that you were worried about the, them getting worn out or vandalized. Can you talk about you talking, making it bulletproof? Yeah. Can talk about that some more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not muted, am I? Good. <laughs> uh, w there are techniques and manufacturers that make things as strong as they can be. And so the, the signs that are on the Lucy Evans deck, uh, Nature Center deck, they are a good example. They're made by a company that uh, makes freeway signs, um, and they are uh, about the, the strongest, least fade resist, or most fade resistant um, and cleanable surfaces that are out there. That said, um, I, if, I don't know if you've been out to East Palo Alto and seen the, what's left of, of some interpretive signs that have been put up by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they uh, have been tagged and, and kind of beaten into the ground. And so we are, we're going to try to continue our work with East Palo Alto to try and get community members to help maintain those signs so that there's a voice in the community about, hey, protect these, these, this, these are us too. Um, and so, uh, we've also limited uh, you know, things that could be broken more easily, like interactive exhibits, um, to, to areas where they can be sequestered and protected. Uh, we're also going to need to have a program to clean them on a regular basis. 
as I don't think it's realistic to have for the Rangers to be able to do that all the time. Um, and uh, we've uh, got volunteers, uh, EPA's, East Palo Alto's got volunteers. Um, and so having a, a group that comes together to do this, I think will really help foster that ownership of them as well. I think that's a really good idea. I am concerned about them getting tagged. And so if they get tagged, you'll be able to just wash off that paint or what, what's the process for detagging it? Yeah, there's it's kind of washing is the first step. And then there are chemicals that doesn't harm the surface of the sign, but we'll take the paint off. Okay. Good. Uh, another thing is, uh, are there gonna be benches nearby? Because I can envision grandparents taking the grandchildren out and the grandchildren want to go and, and read every word on the plaque and the <laughs> grand father wants to sit down and, and rest his legs while the kids are busy. There are existing benches out near some of the installation sites. We have been uh, purposely not putting signs in front of benches because when people are sitting, they like to enjoy the view and we don't want to yeah. block, block their view. And so we put them near benches, but not, um, not too close. We're also being very conscious of accessibility. Many of the levees out there are not currently accessible to all. Um, there, I think everybody is waiting for a levy raising and rebuilding project. When that happens, these signs, uh, because they're existing conditions, will be pulled and then reinstalled uh, at, 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 uh, you know, on top of the levy. And I think it's, it's that time is when we can make these all fully, fully accessible. Um, it's, it's been a challenge. We're definitely putting them in areas that are accessible, but there are some areas because of grades and because of substates, substrates over a vast area that it's not practical. Um, to make those fully accessible. And do you know the content or do you just have a rough idea of what the content's going to be? We, we know the content in, in detail. Uh, I, Alex Hamilton especially has been you know, sort of going over and over the language for these things. And James, the educators uh, at, the, at the Gina Museum have been reviewing it all. It's now being translated um, and then it has to be laid out. And I don't know if you've ever tried to write exhibit labels. It's actually an art to be able to communicate something relatively complex um, in very few <laughs> words um, in, in a way that's readable. Uh, so it's, it's, it, we've got a good team working on it. Yeah, it's like PowerPoint <laughs> yeah. cubed, yes. <laughs> Distill it down, it's very difficult. Uh, that, uh, would you be able to share that content with us? It'd be really nice for us to take a peek through it and just see if we have any feedback. Yeah, I think so. It may come to you in several files. Um, because it, we've got it as, uh, yeah, as, as Word documents, I could, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find a form, a, a way to bundle these together. It's a fair amount of information because <laughs> um, they're all organized by nodes and, and location, what you're seeing, um, and, then, and then the text. Um, but sure, okay. I'd be happy to. Oh, that'd be wonderful, thank you. Uh, and lastly, this is for Darren. Uh, the path of the Friendship, Friendship Trail ends up at Cooley Landing. Uh, there's that one stretch, the last little stretch is uh, not a real trail, it's just kind of a dirt uh, volunteer trail. Uh, there was some thought about getting an, an easement on that. Is there any progress on that? There was an attempt to make progress, as John can tell you, during this, during this endeavor for the signage, we reached out again to the property owner and we had done so twice before and on all three occasions were denied uh, there was just no interest on the property owner's um, behalf to provide access, to provide an easement, to do a developed trail. Okay. Uh, from a public good standpoint, that's a really bad decision. So I think yeah. we need to pursue this other ways. But we'll... we, we haven't given up. We are still working with City of East Palo Alto and Mid Penn. Mid Penn, of course, owns the Ravenswood Preserve, and East Palo Alto's got property adjacent to. And all three agencies, Palo Alto and its other two, are all interested in seeing if we can work something out. So I, I think there, there's an interest in teaming up, which we hadn't done before. It was a multi agency approach. So maybe that will bear fruit. Um, we started conversations and COVID hit and they sort of derailed, but we'll be picking that up again uh, as soon as time allows and see if we can make headway. The, the yeah. only other option is cantilevering over the, the marsh itself, which is very, very expensive. Uh, oh. And the other option is eminent domain, but you've yeah. got to have a real strong uh, case. This is 
this will qualify for eminent domain and just the threat of it may be enough to get them to sell. And that's what happened to the trailer park down in South Palo Alto is that we didn't use eminent domain, but when we started talking about it, they became much more interested in selling to us. So I think anyway. the building permits are through East Palo Alto and I think they're the ones that should apply that pressure to, um, to um, as, a, as a planning uh, approval process. I think the Joint Powers Board has the ability down there. Mm -hmm. That's in their jurisdiction, but, but that's a lawyer question. Okay, thank you, John. Good work. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, Commissioner Brown. Great presentation. It seems like, although it was a lengthy process, there was a lot of good input that came um, down to the footings of the signs. Um, throughout that uh, process. And so very excited. My best friend happens to live in East Palo Alto and we're both Spanish speakers. So I'll look forward to enjoying this with her. So thank you, Dan. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, John. Uh, it's great to see that the uh, light at the end of the tunnel is in view now. I'm, I'm sure you appreciate that more than, more than all of us. Uh, the other commissioners have really governed my questions. Uh, are there any remaining specific challenges or significant concerns you have in, as far as getting to the finish line? The deed restrictions, I've always been kind of tricky. Um, our city attorneys met with the state attorneys to come up with a plan to say, we're not going to book the entire parcel or even the entire levy as a We'll put a restriction on all of that um, because of uh, various issues with moving of levies and things like that. Um, so what we've done is we've actually surveyed each of the installation sites and we're just putting a deed restriction on those. And we still have to go back and get state the state to approve uh, of the actual language for it. They've approved it in concept. So I, th I think we're actually really on the home stretch here. I think once that's done, I'll, I'll feel real safe. <laughs> Thank you. Well, John, that, excuse me, that's just, it's all great news, a wonderful presentation. I love it to see that our two communities working together um, to accomplish what's going to be a wonderful goal. So thank you, thank you, thank you for um, coming tonight and sharing all of that with us. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing that copy um, as well. So. Okay, Darren, let's move on to the uh, tentative agenda for June 22nd. Thanks, Chair. I've got uh, three potential ones. One for sure is the Park Improvement Ordinance for the Tidegate Project. We'd very much like to have on the June agenda. Um, th if we move quickly enough with the ad hoc on the sidewalk vendor regulations, potentially bring that in June. But I believe the attorney said we could also do July as an option. So maybe we play that one by year um, to see how much progress we make with the ad hoc and how quickly we're, we're ready to bring that back for an action. And then lastly, depending on um, progress with our next meeting, perhaps a, a beginning skate park conversation. I was gonna ask about that, if that would be appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what, and would we have any um, information about um, the city budget uh, in the staff report? Yeah, yeah. Or, the department report we should have. Um, it'll just be the day before, yes, a couple right. days before. So um, it might not be very robust, but yes, I'm sure I could have at least the basics and some of the key impacts to um, park and rec related CSD uh, budget. Okay, great. Darren, have you had any feedback from the fire department? I would love yes. to hear something about uh, fire safety up there. Yes. Yeah. Thank I, I submitted a request just for the benefit of everyone else. Commissioner Rechtal emailed me saying, very interested in having the latest on fire safety for the whole Foothills area. I forward that to the Office of Emergency Services and the fire department. They're working right now on an informational report that will go to city council on June 21st. Mm -hmm. That's not a presentation, but I had asked, would they be willing? And said, well, let's look into that and we'll see. Um, so I've got both the chief from fire and the chief from OES uh, looking into this and seeing if they might be able to either give us a presentation or whether that would go to council and we could listen in um, one or the other, but yeah. I did express the interest. I'm really yeah. concerned that the, there's so many people up there, if something happened 
evacuating the people off the trails, th that's just a logistics nightmare. And I think we should put some thought into it now before, before it happens. Okay, keep us in the loop. Thanks, Darren. Good, thank you. And thanks for bringing that up, Keith. I, it was on my list to ask Darren about it. So um, you beat me to it and I'm glad. Um, any other comments or announcements? Uh, back, back on agenda, were we looking for potentially an update from Friends of Palo Alto Parks and the uh, Palo Alto Recreation Foundation? Well, I guess we could be, we talked about it, but um, I think maybe we wait for the work plan approvals will be back, Darren, right? Uh, yes. Go to council on the 21st. I think that's what somebody said. So we'll have our meeting after that. Um, in some respects, we really can't do very much until we hear from the attorney about fundraising and all of that. So <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. I, I guess we could, we could talk to Roger um, and Jack Morton about uh, potentially having uh, those two groups come just for just for a discussion. I, I guess it'd be at least useful to get them primed to be coming sometime soon. We'll, we'll, we'll sort out the date, but let yeah. them uh, think about what they want to present. Yeah, I th I, th I think that's right. Um, so either either June or or maybe July feels a little bit better, but we'll keep it on the list. So. And what about a bullware update? Is that waiting on the budget or? Uh, I'll have to talk to Peter Jensen on that one. I'll, I'll let you know. And along with that, I guess if, if we hear about the budget, then what we hear about Rink Not a Park. Yeah. Probably as well, so. Okay. Well, good. Any other comments or announcements? I have a couple. Um, um, the Friends of Coverly is going to meet on the 30th. It was postponed a week. Um, uh, I'm going to be very interested to know what progress is being made between the school district and the city. I know that uh, Council uh, Councilwoman Koo is, is on that committee and um, and I know that they have met, uh, but it'll be very interesting to um, hear what we can do. Uh, first of all, the school district has been uh, more forthcoming after the PG&E issue uh, this summer, uh, this winter, um, looking at all that vacant uh, parking lot, um, or if we're, uh, we need to move forward with the city doing something unilaterally on their seven acres. So um, I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if Councilwoman who has any updates or whether we wait till the 30th. Yeah, we, we um, the ad hoc committee has not met uh, officially. We're just kind of trying to determine the framework of what the discussion is gonna be. So not officially yet. Okay. I had two other comments. Um, one is, that uh, the city of Mountain View, uh, right on the board, border with Palo Alto, has made a beautiful new park called Fayette, uh, Fayette um, Parkway, which sits right on top of the Hetch Hetchy uh, right of way behind the CVS um, at the corner of San Antonio and El Camino. And it, it's worthy of people looking at it. Mm -hmm. And we have a stretch uh, near Gunn High School that could use the same treatment or be maybe become a dog park or something like that. So when we talk about new recreation uh, opportunities, that could be one that we look at in the future, not necessarily this year or the next year, but I would like to see it on a, you know, a CA, CIP mm -hmm. looking at that. Um, but people should go see what it looks like um, behind the CVS. The third uh, comment I want to make is that the, I don't know if people have been to the Renzel Pond out there at the Baylands recently, but it is spectacular. 
it's uh, the the uh, growth and the number of birds uh, is fantastic. Um, and the uh, I really should write a note to uh, to uh, Karen North uh, that they did such a great job. And um, uh, I just think people should look, should go see it. That's all I have. Thank you, David, for the encouragement. That's great. It's good to know. I have a quick question for Darren. Uh, I've heard some reports that trash garbage has been piling up in the parks uh, sometimes, especially on weekends. I was curious if the uh, staffing for that was reduced during COVID or, had, or basically the question is where is staffing, what is the staffing level compared to pre-COVID times? And is this something that we're in a position to uh, better address? Uh, the challenge is very much a um, staff related issue and primarily with our contracted out sites. This is our landscape maintenance contract with um, Brightview and they maintain the vast majority of the urban parks. The contract was reduced last July because of the budget deficit by about 26% and it has had an impact. I think those are the, the, the early telltales will be weeds and trash. And so as the track, and I guess there's a, a, a third um, impact, and that's the increased number of park visitors since COVID. Not only open space is impacted with increased numbers that you learned about tonight, but urban parks as well. And so we still have the same infrastructure, same number of trash cans. In fact, in some areas, there have been impacts when we had to convert to the three sort system. Um, it means fewer trash cans and more compost. And sometimes they don't get used as often. They fill up um, for the reasons I mentioned before, either they aren't being as emptied as quickly or loose litter is not collected as often because there's fewer staff there. Um, and what we're trying to do is work with Zero Waste uh, who instituted this three sort rule, pushed it forward and got it approved to help us either with capacity or if there's any ways that they can get additional resources for us. but. The reduction in Brightview is definitely one of the impacts that led to this. Well, oh, thanks for clarifying that. That that's, seems very important for city council to understand as they're considering the, the budget trade-offs right now. Uh, it is particularly demoralizing when you see trash piled up around the trash cans where yeah. it's a capacity slash servicing issue uh, clearly. And uh, uh, one question that was raised to me is, is are there any kind of uh, stormwater uh, runoff uh, regulations that uh, we could potentially be in, in, in violation of if, if trash is, is piling up and, and some of this is, is getting into our waterways? And they, have, and they have funding and they have guaranteed funding, uh, stormwater. So could we use some of those, their resources to keep trash out of the storm, storm drains? Could certainly try. They've never come to the table for this kind of thing in the past, but um, we could certainly certainly ask. Yeah, we have a green stormwater initiative liaison. They can <laughs> push for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know someone on the stormwater committee too. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and, and, and my daughter works in, in stormwater for the city of Sunnyvale. So, so. Well, Darren, is this a time, you know, in the past we've mentioned something about adopt a park uh, for neighborhood associations and given the increased use for urban, ur urban parks, is this something we should be thinking about for the summertime? I think that would be valuable for different reasons. I don't think it solves this particular problem. Typically when we've got the litter getter programs and they're going out and getting loose litter, they deposit that in a park trash can. At least I have, and I've I've led, I've started litter getter programs before and I'm a participant in them. And most people aren't taking that home. They're mm. depositing it. And our problem is the capacity, especially on weekends at the urban parks has exceeded um, what we have available. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, it's a combination of additional resources to service them. In some cases, maybe on weekends. In other cases, either it's an exemption to that rule because there aren't always space so if we wanted to add one more trash can, you have to add three, right? You have to add recycling, compost, and trash. And in many places, that's not feasible mm -hmm. um, just for the space that you have allotted. 
And so either we get an exemption to allow us to add an extra trash because uh, the alternative is much worse. We don't want loose trash floating around getting into our waterways. Well, well it's, it sounds like one of the bigger issues is increasing the capacity of the trash trash to, as opposed to the recycling Dumpster. or Dumpster. the compost. Mm -hmm. Dumpsters instead of trash cans. Well, the, good news, the good news is that when you look at Coverly Field, for instance, um, having your partners, the soccer uh, clubs and, cl and camps, they uh, insisting that they clean up their trash after they leave has been, ex has been uh, quite successful, at least at Coverly Field. Um, so if we can use that as a model and get uh, all of our partners to uh, insist that people take their trash with them, uh, I think that will be uh, will take some of the burden off. But I think what uh, Jeff is saying is that there are areas that are have nothing to do with sports, but more to do with picnickers. Mm -hmm. So, is there a way that you could get an exemption for this just for the summertime and call it a pilot program and get one more can for just the trash trash? Yeah, and in some cases, the problem is is such that we're just moving forward right away with it. And uh, Bull Park is a good example. I've gotten a number of complaints uh, on Bull Park in particular. It's certainly not unique to that one, but we'll probably be deploying a single trash can um, rather than the cluster of three in a few key areas just to address the immediate concern while we work with zero waste for a more permanent solution. Okay, well, thank you for all that information. Yeah, sure. And, and the single can approach, I'll. I'll I'll, I'll point out it, it is problematic because if you just have one can, then you're going to get compost and recycling items in there that, that are going to go into the landfill that, that wouldn't otherwise. So it's, I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, so I, I was thinking it would be an additional that, that you'd, you'd keep the three cans and then bring one additional can just for the trash. <laughs> that That's what we do. Yeah. But I think Chair's point is still that it'll end up being the recipient of mixed. Um, yep, it will. Yeah. Overflow. Okay. Well, I think that's probably leads us to adjourning tonight. Um, Darren, thank you for um, all of the speakers and lining all of that up. I thought it was a very informative meeting. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so, one thing I want to mention, the council talked Monday about trash and recycling. And if you didn't see that, it's worth going in the video. I thought the council members asked some very good questions. And a lot of, you know, the, when was about six months ago, a year ago, they talked to us. And I thought that they answered some of the questions better last night, the, the staff did, or I mean, Monday night. No, that was last night. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, the bad news is that a lot of the mixed paper is going overseas and Mm -hmm. You don't really know if it's being recycled or whatever. So it, it's worth watching what the council talked about on Monday night. Great. Good to know. Okay. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I will move that we adjourn before, 10, a, before 10 p.m. I second that. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of May and Memorial Day, and we'll see you in June. Um, okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.